My name is Alex Porter, and this happened to me on February 21, 1997. It was my first solo field assignment with the CIA. Well, solo in the loosest of terms. Being new to the Classified Operations Division, I still wasn't sure exactly what kind of rabbit hole they were sending me down, only that it all sounded a little too outlandish, even for us. My mission was to investigate a series of bizarre disappearances in and around the Okafenoki Swamp. Sprawling across the border between southeastern Georgia and northern Florida, the Okafenoki is one of the largest intact freshwater wetlands in the U.S. A primeval wilderness where legends of strange beasts and lost civilizations have echoed for centuries. I'd always been a skeptic, a rational man in a world that sometimes defied all reason. Still, I couldn't deny the growing sense of uneasiness gnawing at me as I made my way down to Hickox, a tiny town on the swamp's edge. Hickox was the kind of place you miss if you blink driving down the highway. A general store, a gas station, a worn-out diner with faded Coca-Cola signs. The kind of place where locals eye out of towners with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. I sought out the local sheriff, Sheriff Hank Bell. A bear of a man, Sheriff Bell had a face etched with deep lines that spoke of long, hard days and maybe even longer nights. He greeted me with a drawl as slow and thick as molasses and a handshake that crushed my fingers. As expected, the sheriff was a man of few words. Ain't much to tell, Sheriff Bell said, leaning back in his creaky chair. Folks go missing. Hikers, the occasional hunter. Never turn up no trace, no scent. I asked him about the rumors, about local legends whispered around campfires. He dismissed them out of hand, just tall tales from a board town. Still, there was a glint in his eye, a hesitation I couldn't quite place. After leaving the station, I decided to walk around town. Locals watched me from their porches, their stares lingering longer than what felt comfortable. I decided to try the diner, hoping to pick up some conversation, maybe a scrap of local gossip that the sheriff wouldn't share. Inside, the diner buzzed with a low hum of chatter. I took a seat at the counter and ordered some truly horrible coffee and a slice of apple pie that was surprisingly good. Next to me sat an old man with faded tattoos and a weathered cowboy hat. He seemed to be nursing the same cup of coffee he'd had when I walked in. After a couple of glances my way, he spoke, his voice hoarse. You that fella asking about the vanishings? I'm looking into it. I replied, keeping my response intentionally vague. The old man stared into the dark depths of his mug, his face unreadable. Ever hear tell of the swamp blower? He had my attention. Can't say I have. Most ain't, he muttered. Old folk story. Parents used to warn kids misbehaving, saying the swamp blower'd come get em in the night. Snatched em up never to be seen again. He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. Thing is, sometimes even grown folk disappear. Folks would know these swamps better than their own backyard. He shrugged, his eyes clouded with something like fear. I thank the old man, leaving my untouched coffee on the counter. Back at my motel, that night I tried to write a report, to find logic in all this. The missing person cases were few, spread out over decades. Could it all be explained by accidents, animal attacks, or deliberate vanishings? Sleep was a restless affair filled with strange, vivid dreams whispers of something moving in the shadows, a feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. It was hard to shake the image of the old man in the diner, the conviction in his voice. The next morning... I decided to get into the swamp myself, to see firsthand what I was dealing with. 
I rented an old, battered John boat from a bait shop and set off alone, armed only with a map, a compass, and the old man's unsettling story in my head. The deeper I ventured into the Okafinoki, the more oppressive it felt. The air was still and humid, the dense tangle of cypress trees and lily pads closing in around me. The water was dark, reflecting the twisted branches like skeletal fingers reaching out from below. There was a primeval silence, broken only by the croaking of frogs and the relentless buzz of mosquitoes. Hours passed as I navigated the maze-like waterways. The sense I wasn't alone grew with each twist and turn of the boat. I swore I could hear rustling in the undergrowth, as if something just out of sight was paralleling my movements. Every rustle, every splash, sent a jolt of adrenaline through my system. Yet each time I turned my head, I saw nothing but the endless tangle of vegetation. With the sun starting its slow descent, I decided to head back. Turning the John boat around a particularly dense cluster of cypress, I suddenly recoiled. There, not ten feet away, was a face. Not a human face, though. It was broad and flattened, eyes set wide apart and bulging. Its mouth stretched in a wide grimace, revealing rows of jagged teeth. The skin was a mottled green-brown, textured like rough bark. The stench hit me next, a foul mix of rotting vegetation and stagnant water. Before I could process what I was seeing, the creature lunged. I barely had time to raise my arm before its claws ripped across my chest, sending a jolt of pain through my body. The creature's weight slammed into the boat, its momentum nearly capsizing us. I stumbled my guns slipping from my grasp as I fought to regain my footing. The creature hissed, a sound like rusted nails against wet glass, before diving beneath the murky surface. Scrabbling in the bottom of the boat, I managed to retrieve my weapon and shakily aimed it at the water, heart pounding like a war drum against my ribs. The creature didn't resurface. I sat there, gasping for breath, unable to tear my gaze from the spot where it had disappeared. My arm throbbed, and blood seeped through my torn shirt. The sun dipped below the tree lean, casting long, ominous shadows across the swamp. I knew I needed to get out of there, to get back and report. Report what? Whatever that creature was, it could not be explained away. It didn't fit the profile of any known animal of any local legend. The swamp blower of the old man's tales made real? It was crazy, but a part of me clung to that ridiculous story as the only thing that made any sort of sense. Panic started to worm its way through my veins. I turned the boat, frantically working the small outboard motor, desperate to put as much distance between myself and that thing as I could. The air grew heavy, the sense of something watching me intensifying with each passing second. The ride back through the twilight was a blur of fear and adrenaline. Every snag in the water looked like the creature in my terror-fueled imagination. I had no idea if it was stalking me, waiting for the opportune moment to attack again. When I finally reached the dock, night had well and truly fallen, cloaking the swamp in impenetrable darkness. I stumbled back to my motel, clutching my injured arm and trying to rationalize what I had seen. No matter how I twisted the events, there was no way I could write this off as an animal attack. I cleaned my wounds as best I could and wrapped them with a ragged towel, ignoring the throbbing pain. I needed to report this. Needed to warn the locals. I reached for the phone, but as I lifted the receiver... A sound echoed through the room. A scraping sound, a dragging sound coming from under my bed. Frozen in terror, I slowly lowered the receiver. The noise stopped. I waited, barely breathing, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The scrape started again, closer this time, 
followed by a low, guttural growl that sent ice down my spine. My vision swam as a wave of dizziness washed over me. I was going to die here, in this rundown motel room at the edge of the swamp, torn to pieces by some nightmare creature straight out of folklore. I thought of the missing persons, of the sheriff's haunted look, and the old man's whispered warnings in the diner. Then, a surge of anger cut through my fear. I wasn't going down without a fight. Grabbing the lamp from the bedside table, I slowly lowered myself to the floor, peering into the darkness. There it was. Its reptilian eyes glowed with a predatory gleam in the dim light filtering in from the bathroom. The creature's massive form was wedged halfway under the bed, and I watched in horrified fascination as it attempted to pull itself free. The muscles along its back rippled as it strained against the space, splintering the cheap wooden frame with a loud crack. I lunged forward, swinging the lamp with all my strength. It connected with the creature's head, sending it reeling back with a pained hiss. I swung again and again, driving it further back under the bed. There was a sudden tearing sound, followed by a shriek of pain that made my ears ring. Seizing the moment, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the door. I yanked it open, slammed it behind me, and ran. Bursting through the motel office, I desperately yelled for the man behind the desk. At first, there was only confused silence and then a muffled boom like a gunshot, followed by a chilling bellow that shook the walls. I barely took shelter behind the front desk before the creature burst through the door, shattering the flimsy structure. There was another crash, and a scream cut short. The creature roared again, a sound of fury and pain. I knew then it wouldn't pursue me. Not right away. Crouched on the dirty carpet, I could hear the sounds of destruction, the creature's enraged movements muffled by the flimsy walls. Sheriff Bell arrived within the hour, lights flashing and sirens wailing. When he and his men stormed in, weapons drawn, I heard more gunshots, followed by an eerie silence. Cautiously, they searched the wreckage of the room. When they finally emerged, the disbelief on their faces was almost comical. The body was gone. All that remained was a scattering of dark blood staining the carpet, an overturned bed, and a splintered doorway hanging off its hinges as a testament to the night's horrors. At the hospital, they stitched my wounds closed and gave me a hefty dose of painkillers. Sheriff Bell sat by my bed, staring off into the middle distance. He told me no one had believed him that his reports about the missing persons, the strange circumstances, had been dismissed as the ramblings of a small-town lawman with an overactive imagination. I reckon I ain't the only one owes you an apology, he said softly. His face was weathered and tired, like something essential had been carved out of him. When I was released from the hospital, they handed me a file. It was my case report, heavily redacted. The cause of the incident was officially listed as an unknown animal attack. The disappearance of the motel clerk was classified as a separate missing persons case. I knew my report, when it reached Langley, would be relegated to some forgotten archive, joining countless other unexplained encounters. I left Hickox the very same day driving until the Okafinoki was nothing but a speck in my rearview mirror. In the years that followed, I took on different missions, saw my share of darkness in far-flung corners of the world. But the incident in the swamp lingered, a shadow I could never fully outrun. There would always be nights where I woke in a cold sweat, the reek of stagnant water heavy in the air, the piercing yellow eyes of the creature fresh in my mind. Sometimes I'd see news reports out of Georgia, unexplained disappearances on the edge of a vast wilderness, cases forever unsolved. I knew, without a doubt, that it was continuing its gruesome work in the depths of the Okafinoki. 
The aftermath is a quiet sort of haunting. I moved on with my life, got married, had a daughter. But a piece of me remains trapped back in that mosquito-infested swamp. I told myself, in the beginning, that the creature was an anomaly, some evolutionary aberration or undiscovered species. Over time I've come to the chilling realization that might not be the whole truth. There were rumors in the agency, whispers about things lurking in remote corners of the earth. And sometimes, late at night when my daughter is fast asleep, I wonder how many more creatures like the swamp blower exist, hidden in the darkness, and how long it will be before they come out of the shadows. My name is Michael Bennett, and this happened to me on July 26, 2009. After 12 years in the military, I landed a job with the CIA. Nothing too high level. I wasn't the globetrotting, martini drinking type. Instead, they put me in an obscure division tucked away within the intelligence directorate. My work was, frankly, boring, sifting through reports analyzing potential threats, the bureaucratic equivalent of watching paint dry. Until, that is, the case file landed on my desk. The reports were sparse, mostly sightings and whispered rumors, all centered on the Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State. Mount Rainier stands as a behemoth, a stratovolcano casting a long, ominous shadow over the surrounding forests. It's a beautiful and dangerous place, filled with hikers, campers, and the occasional Bigfoot enthusiast. Nothing in the file suggested anything out of the ordinary, not at first glance. I requested more information and got a brick wall. Everything was classified accessible only to those with the highest security clearances. Which was odd because the events described, while unsettling, weren't the usual sort that got the security agencies scrambling. Then again, unsettling, didn't quite do it justice. There were reports of ravaged campsites, mangled beyond the capabilities of any known predator. Missing persons cases, with zero trace of the victims ever found. All those incidents neatly tucked away under misadventure or unexplained disappearances. My analyst's mind was itching. There was a pattern here, something those in the know didn't want the public, or even most of the agency, to recognize. I decided to take my weekend and go see for myself. My wife, Susan, always indulgent of my weird fixations, thought I was in desperate need of a break from the office. She wasn't wrong, but there was a nagging feeling inside of me a hunch I couldn't ignore. The drive from Olympia took most of the day. Mount Rainier loomed larger with every mile, its snowy peak stark against the summer sky. I entered the park near the southeastern corner, following a narrow road bordered by dense, towering evergreens. There was a stillness to the forest, a sense of something watching from the depths of the trees. It put me on edge, I found a campsite near the Nisqually River, pitched my tent, and set out to explore. The trail wound through old-growth forest, sunlight dappling the forest floor. It was peaceful, almost idyllic, and if not for the file burning a hole in my backpack, I might have actually relaxed. After a couple of hours of hiking, I came across something disturbing a campsite that looked like it had been hit by a tornado. Slash tents scattered gear, the lingering scent of something sour hanging in the air. Then I saw the blood. Dark streaks smeared against the trunk of a Douglas fir. Too much blood for an animal. No body, no sign of a struggle, just that chilling splash of red against the rough bark. It was enough. I knew the file hadn't been exaggerating, that something was very, very wrong here. I snapped some pictures and hurried back to my own camp, 
the sense of being watched intensifying with every step. Back at my tent, I radioed in, requesting backup. The response wasn't enthusiastic. They were suspicious, questioned my reasons, my assessment. I stood my ground, knowing something they didn't, and eventually, they relented. A team would be dispatched, but it would take hours, likely until nightfall, before they arrived. In the meantime, I wasn't about to sit around as bait. I packed up my gear, stowing my firearm in my pack where I could easily reach it. Dusk was approaching, casting long shadows, and the forest began to transform. The earlier tranquility was replaced by an undercurrent of unease. I followed the river upstream, figuring my best chance was to find a clear area where the team could land a helicopter. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, the woods took on an eerie glow, the shadows deepening. That was when I saw it. Movement a flicker between the trees. At first, I thought it was a deer, but as it moved closer, a wave of dread hit me. This was no animal. It was massive, hulking, its silhouette bipedal but impossibly tall. I raised my gun, trying to steady my shaking hands. As it stepped into a patch of moonlight, I got a clear look at it. It was, well, there's no easy way to describe it. Covered in coarse, dark hair, hunched, its arms so long they almost dragged on the ground. But it was the face I'll never forget. Not quite human, with a protruding jawbone, tiny, deep-set eyes, and an expression neither curious nor malevolent, but chillingly, indifferent. I fired. The sound of the gunshot echoed, almost comically out of place in the wilderness. The creature flinched, and for a second, its eyes locked with mine, burning with a cold, alien intelligence. It let out a roar that rattled through my bones, a mix of fury and pain, turned, and disappeared back into the trees. I stood there, frozen, the stench of it lingering in the air. My gun felt useless in my hands. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't natural, not anything I understood. And then I remembered the team. They were coming. And I'd just led whatever that thing was straight to them. I started to run, stumbling over roots and rocks, driven by a desperate, primal terror. As I ran... I heard more roars, more crashes echoing through the woods. When I reached the clearing near my original campsite, it was already too late. The helicopter was there, its rotor blades still turning, but it lay shattered amidst the trees. There were bodies, mangled things torn with brutal strength. I saw my team, or what was left of them, and vomited right there on the forest floor. I don't remember much of what happened next. There's a blur of running, of the creature's roars closing in like a hunter toying with its prey. There was the taste of blood in my mouth. I must have fallen, hit my head. Then somehow, miraculously, headlights pierced the darkness of beat-up old truck barreling recklessly down the narrow road. It screeched to a halt, and a man jumped out, shotgun in hand. You all right? His voice was rough, tinged with a local accent. I just stared dumbly at the chaos I'd stumbled out of, the shattered helicopter, the bodies. The creature was gone, vanished back into the trees as silently as it had appeared, but I could still feel those inhuman eyes locked on me. The man, a grizzled park ranger named Hank, took in the scene with a grim set to his jaw. He'd heard the disturbance, figured it was someone in trouble. What he hadn't expected was this level of carnage. When I finally managed to speak, my voice was barely a whisper. I told him everything, the sightings, the creature, the attack. I expected him to think I was crazy, probably concussed, but he didn't bat an eye. Just nodded, his grip tightening on the shotgun. Seen em before them things, he muttered. 
Most folks don't live to tell the tale. There was more than acceptance in his voice. There was a flicker of something like resignation. We spent the rest of the night securing what was left of the scene for the cleanup crew that would no doubt arrive within hours. Every rustle in the trees, every hoot of an owl, sent shivers down my spine. Hank told me stories, whispers passed down through generations of rangers and locals. Stories of disappearances stretching back decades, of creatures that were both impossibly real and utterly unreal. Some folks say they're old, older than these hills, he said softly, staring into the campfire we had built to keep off the encroaching chill. Something that ain't supposed to be. With the first light of dawn, an official team swooped in. Black suits, grim faces, and efficient protocols that swept the scene clean with disquieting speed. There was no mention of a creature, of course. The helicopter was explained as a freak accident, the deaths blamed on animal attacks, a convenient bear or cougar already scapegoated and killed just in case. My report was buried, redacted into oblivion. I was warned. A gentle suggestion to take some time off, to put this whole incident behind me. They offered me compensation, hush money to keep my silence. It was clear. The truth, the impossible truth, was officially non-existent. For weeks, I barely functioned. Sleep was impossible. The creatures in human face haunting my waking hours and the terror of the attack fueling ceaseless nightmares. My wife, bless her, thought it was just PTSD, sought help from doctors and therapists. Nothing worked. I couldn't tell her the truth the absurdity of it all. Instead, I withdrew, retreated to the basement, spending hours staring at maps and files I managed to smuggle out from work, scouring the internet for legends and myths that mirrored what I had seen. It became an obsession. The creature, the cover-up, it consumed me. I knew, with cold certainty, that it wasn't an isolated incident. That out there, in the vast stretches of wilderness, other creatures like it existed. And the agency was keeping them a secret from the world. One morning, I awoke with a new resolve. I couldn't change the past, but I could still choose my future, and I refused to spend it running scared. Armed with my training, my weapon, and my stubborn determination, I made a decision. I walked away from my job from my comfortable life. Susan thought I had finally snapped, lost my mind to grief and delusion. The fight was a brutal one, tearing at the very fabric of our marriage. In the end, she couldn't follow me into the darkness, and I couldn't blame her. For the past five years, I've lived on the fringe, a nomad, always moving. I track rumors, whispers of strange sightings in remote national parks and forests. I've set up a network, a loose affiliation of park rangers, hunters, native elders, people who have seen glimpses of the impossible and been dismissed as loons or drunkards. It's not much of a life. It's dangerous, constantly living in the shadow of that which most people refuse to believe. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if I made the right choice, sacrificed my sanity on the altar of a monstrous truth. But then I think of the missing, swallowed whole by the wilderness. I think of that campsite bathed in blood, of my team, and a cold fury sparks in me. There is no agency out there hunting these creatures, no official task force to protect the unsuspecting. Someone has to stand between the monsters and the rest of the world, even if the world thinks the only monster is me. The aftermath is a long, lonely road. Sometimes I catch glimpses of the creatures. Evidence, always fleeting, massive footprints pressed into the mud, a shred of unnatural fur snag on a branch. Each confirmed sighting is a grim victory, proof to myself that I'm not crazy. I've started documenting everything, 
a chronicle hidden from official channels, a testament meticulously compiled and encrypted online. They can ignore the truth, rewrite the narrative, but they can't erase it entirely. If something happens to me, if I disappear into the wild like so many others, there'll be a record left behind. Perhaps someday, someone else will pick up where I left off, find the clues that lead to the awful truth hidden in the depths of our forgotten places. They might call me delusional, obsessed, a broken man haunted by a past that refuses to stay buried. And maybe they'll be right. But that doesn't change the fact that the creatures are out there. And as long as I'm breathing, so help me, I'll be out there too. My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me in 2008. Back then, I was an ops specialist for the CIA, the kind of guy sent to places tourists avoid and politicians deny knowing about. My ex-jokes I collect passport stamps from countries that technically don't exist. She's not wrong. This mess started in Wyoming. Not the Yellowstone postcard Wyoming. Think endless stretches of windswept grassland, dotted with the occasional ranch so isolated the cows seem lonely. My mission was wildlife surveillance, code for watching some remote research facility with a satellite and reporting on anything unusual. Dull as dirt, except the wildlife they were researching made classified look like an open book. I set up camp on a ridge overlooking the facility. Supplies, high-powered binoculars, and a healthy dose of skepticism about what was really going on down there. City boy like me spends enough time in the wilderness. You start to expect the unexpected, but this, this took the cake. The first few days were mind-numbing routine. Facility was standard bunker-type architecture, security patrols, the usual. Then came the deliveries. Not trucks, like I expected, but military choppers, swooping in under cover of darkness and disgorging crates under armed guard. That got my attention. What warranted that level of secrecy? I spent the next few nights risking frostbite for a closer look. Night three I saw it. It moved like a liquid shadow, slipping between the parked choppers. Not a man at least not one I'd ever encountered. Too tall, limbs impossibly long, ending in clawed hands that blurred when it moved. Its head, that was worst. Triangular, with eyes that reflected moonlight with an eerie luminescence. My blood ran cold, training momentarily forgotten in the face of something so fundamentally wrong. I snapped a photo, hand trembling. Blurry as hell but proof I wasn't hallucinating out there on that frozen ridge. Radioing in was a gamble. Protocol for a sighting like this was complicated. In the end, duty outweighed common sense. I sent the photo back to Langley, along with a report that must have read like a man-man's ramblings. Expected radio silence, reprimand, maybe a mandatory psych eval. What I got was far, far worse. The extraction team came at dawn. Not the usual guys. These moved with a lethal precision that screamed black ops. Orders were curt, voices devoid of any inflection but menace. Surrender your gear. You saw nothing. You are returning to base. They blindfolded me, loaded me onto a chopper, and flew for what felt like hours. When the blindfold came off, I was in a concrete cell, bare but for a single flickering light bulb. Interrogation was unpleasant. They wanted details, creatures' behavior, facility layout, whatever intel I could provide. My insistence that I wasn't sure what the hell I'd seen cut no ice. Then came the twist. They weren't there to lock me up or discredit me. They had a job for me. 
the brass had decided the best way to monitor the asset, as they chillingly called it, was from the inside. They'd fake my death, insert me into that research facility, and I'd become their eyes and ears. Refusal wasn't exactly an option. This wasn't a request, more of an offer I couldn't decline, delivered by men who just as soon break me as bargain with me. Fast forward six months, and I'm Jason Novak, a biologist conveniently eager to work at a cutting-edge, highly secretive research project. The pay was obscene, enough to set my ex up for life, just in case things went very wrong, which I suspected they would. The facility was a labyrinth of sterile corridors and reinforced labs. Security was suffocating. Coworkers were tight-lipped types, the ones who either loved the isolation or were running from something themselves. Nobody asked questions, and I followed suit. Then I saw it again. Up close this time. They kept it contained, experimented upon. I witnessed things those scientists with their steely eyes and meticulous notes couldn't comprehend. The creature wasn't simply an anomaly. It was cunning, observant, with flashes of an intelligence that chilled me far more than its razor-sharp claws. Worse yet, there was a feral desperation to it now, like a trapped animal that senses the slaughterhouse. It watched me, the outsider, like I might be a way out. That's when the plan started to form. Not some heroic rescue, mind you, survival was my only goal. I smuggled notes alongside my official reports, stashed tools I might need. The creature and I were on the same damn side, both prisoners in a cage we hadn't built. I chose my moment carefully, a system maintenance shutdown they were dreading. In the ensuing chaos, I sabotaged the creature's containment, knowing damn well the carnage it would unleash. Corridors became a bloodbath, alarms echoed, and the whole facility plunged into a desperate lockdown. It was my cover. In the confusion, I made my move. Security was focused on containing the creature, not some lowly biologist who'd used the pandemonium to slip away unnoticed. A well-timed bribe or two ensuring my disappearance from their systems would be conveniently overlooked. The escape itself was a blur of stolen keycards, adrenaline-fueled sprints, and close calls. Reaching the surface felt like a miracle. I stumbled into the desolate Wyoming landscape, dawn painting the sky in streaks of deceptive hope. They'd find me, eventually. Highly trained, angry, and probably assuming I'd gone rogue with potentially catastrophic knowledge. The thought fueled my flight across that barren expanse. Survival became my obsession. I lived off the land as best I could, honed instincts I didn't know I possessed. The wilderness, once a lonely expanse, became an ally. I vanished into the rugged terrain, leaving a trail so faint they'd have needed bloodhounds to find me. But they wouldn't use dogs, couldn't risk news of a monstrous creature rampaging across the countryside. Better to have me quietly disappear, another unsolved mystery in a place that thrives on them. Months turned into years. I shed my old life like a snakeskin. Jason Novak ceased to exist. Alex Thorne, well, even he became a ghost, a shadow moving through truck stops and off-grid settlements, bartering for supplies, trading rumors, and always listening. That's how I heard about the carcass. A mutilated, half-eaten elk high in the mountains, killed with the ferocity no predator around here possessed. The whisper amongst hunters was a cryptid, one of those creatures relegated to campfire tales and local legend. But the description sent a jolt of icy recognition down my spine. The asset had broken out further than they thought. It was a turning point. Before I was the hunted. Now, now the hunter's instinct stirred in me, a primal need to track, to end the threat I'd inadvertently unleashed. 
But this wasn't a simple CIA mission. No backup, no high-tech weaponry, just me against a creature honed by both nature and unnatural experimentation. The hunt consumed me. I followed the fragmented trail of sightings, the half-whispered stories. Isolated livestock killings, disappearances of lone hikers, things easily explained away, if you didn't know what was really out there. Piecing together the creature's movements was a chilling puzzle, revealing a methodical intelligence beneath the brutality. It was learning, adapting, evolving into the perfect apex predator. My gear wasn't CI-issued anymore. A beat-up rifle, supplies cobbled together with survivalist ingenuity, and a resolve that bordered on obsession. My existence boiled down to predator versus prey, with the future of anyone unlucky enough to stumble into those wilds hanging in the balance. The trail led me high into the Bighorn Mountains, the air thin and unforgiving. I pushed on, driven by something I couldn't fully articulate. Duty? Atonement? Maybe just that stubborn sliver of the human spirit that refuses to simply become another victim. Tracks in the snow were evidence the creature favored this desolate territory. The isolation worked both ways. Out here, it was as close to an even playing field as I'd get. The final confrontation happened near a frozen lake. It wasn't some dramatic showdown. Nature rarely tidies itself up for our narrative convenience. One moment I was studying tracks, the next a blur of unnatural movement, claws raking the air inches from my face. The fight was a blur of desperation and instinct. Rifle shots echoed across the mountains. I dodged, rolled, fired back with more luck than skill. Pain ripped through my shoulder as claws found purchase, and then... A searing flash as I shoved a makeshift torch into its eerily glowing eyes. It recoiled with a hiss, the reek of burning flesh filling the air. I scrambled back, fumbling with the rifle, knowing a wounded creature at bay is its most dangerous. And then silence. I scanned the tree lean, rifle raised, but it had vanished. It left a trail of blood on the pristine snow but whether I'd mortally wounded it or merely driven it deeper into hiding, I couldn't tell. The hunt wasn't over, not by a long shot. I staggered back down the mountainside, haunted by the image of those eyes before the torch hit them, the flicker of calculating intelligence promising this wasn't our last encounter. The aftermath? It isn't pretty. I survive on the fringes, Odd jobs under the table, cash tucked away in untraceable accounts. Every out-of-the-ordinary news story sends a spike of adrenaline through me. I'm a ghost, existing only to hunt the monster I helped set loose on the world. And deep down, I know there's a poetic, horrifying justice to that. They sanitize the reports back at Langley. Some dangerous animal— Maybe a rogue experiment escaped, whatever palatable lie they can concoct. The truth is far messier, far less containable. People will still vanish, stories will get stranger, and men like me will keep tracking the shadows, fighting the endless fight against the things we ourselves unleashed. Is there an ending in sight? Doubtful. The creature smart, adaptable. I get older a little slower every year. My beard's got more gray than brown now. Every creak of my joints reminds me I'm mortal. One day, it won't be me out there following the bloody trail, and God help whoever takes my place. Until then, I keep walking, keep watching. Every time I look over my shoulder into the encroaching darkness, I tell myself I'm not the one being hunted. My name is Dylan Carter, and this happened to me in the spring of 2014. I'm a CIA field agent, 
the job title a mask for far more shadowy dealings that the government would like to keep off official books. I'm the cleaner, when diplomacy fails, when things get ugly, and they often do. Word came down that there was some rogue asset wreaking havoc in the remote parts of the Oregon wilderness, specifically a swathe of dense forest nestled in the Cascade Range. It had all the markers of a classic op gone wrong, missing scientists, whispers of a classified project, and a whole lot of official silence about the why and how of it all. The flight there gave me way too much time to think. My wife and I, well, let's just say things were rocky. She hated the long hours, the disappearances, the lies. A regular, ordinary life. That was her constant refrain. Looking out the window at those endless clouds, I had to admit, she wasn't wrong. I landed in a backwater town, all faded signs and closed storefronts. The rental truck I'd secured bounced its way down dirt roads until the trees closed in, a green-black wall blotting out the sky. My contact, Agent Monroe, was already set up in a remote hunter's cabin, old wood, flickering gaslights, and the lingering smell of mildew. "'You're not gonna like this,' was his greeting. He tossed a stack of files on the rickety table. Lab reports— half-burned notes, and some damn grainy photos that made the hair on my neck stand on end. It looked wrong, like a twisted version of a bear, but too elongated, eyes like dull embers, the muzzle a nightmare tangle of teeth. Monroe looked haggard, shadows etched under his eyes. Locals claim it's got unnatural speed, can disappear in a blink. We've lost three men already. Trackers sent in to find those scientists. They, well, what they found wasn't fit for burial. We spent the next day prepping. Hunting rifles with high-powered rounds, flashbangs, and enough tech to make my head spin. All the gadgets in the world wouldn't save us if this thing was as fast and feral as they said. Out here, in these trees, it wasn't man versus beast. It was one predator against another. We tracked the creature for days. Its trail was a gruesome breadcrumb path of half-eaten animal carcasses and a lingering stench of decay. The missing scientist's camp, when we found it, looked like a tornado had ripped through. Smashed tents, scattered equipment, and a whole lot of blood sprayed haphazardly across the forest floor. One thing became abundantly clear— this wasn't some escaped lab experiment. This thing was a hunter, intelligent and cruel. It stalked us in return, a presence in the rustling leaves, the eerie silence that descended when the birds stopped singing. We set the trap in a clearing a deer carcass wired with sensors, us hunkered down in the brush, waiting for the predator to take the bait. Night fell, heavy and oppressive. We took shifts, scanning the tree line until my eyes burned. And then, movement. Not a lumbering gait, but a silent, fluid ripple, like darkness itself had gained form. The deer carcass jerked, wires sparking as they snapped. It was so fast, just a blur of motion and snarls as it tore into the flesh. That's when we unleashed hell. Flash bangs exploded, the sudden burst of light and sound disorienting the creature, buying us precious seconds. Monroe and I opened fire. It howled, a piercing shriek that echoed through the ancient trees. I got a clean shot at its shoulder. It staggered then lunged at Monroe. He went down in a tangle of limbs and claws, his scream cutting off abruptly. I didn't hesitate, didn't think— just emptied my gun, my bullets slamming into the creature's back. It reared up, roaring, and finally, I saw it clearly. Those eyes, glowing amber in the dim light. The stretched skull-like head, the tendons pulling tight across its emaciated form. It twisted its long body, fixing its glowing gaze on me. In that moment, 
I felt a primal terror, an instinctive certainty that I was next on the menu. Then, abruptly, the creature spun around and bolted back into the impenetrable darkness of the forest. I stumbled back, gasping for breath, Monroe's blood hot on my hands. My ears were ringing from the gunshots, the stench of cordite and burnt fur choking the air. I had to move, get out of this kill zone. I grabbed Monroe's rifle, fumbling with the unfamiliar weight of it as I retreated deeper into the trees. Stumbling onward felt like wading through quicksand. Every rustle of leaves, every snap twig set off a surge of adrenaline in my veins. My mind conjured up that loping, skeletal shape stalking me, the glowing eyes watching from the shadows. I came to a gurgling creek and sloshed through the icy water, the shock of it numbing my ragged nerves and forcing a haze of clarity back into my brain. The moon had broken through the cloud cover, painting the world in shades of monochrome. I had no idea where the hell I was, no compass, and a flickering suspicion that my GPS tracker would be useless out here. By daybreak, the forest felt different. Less sinister, but still unnervingly silent. I found a deer trail and followed it, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of the creature. Part of me wanted to run, leave civilization far behind, but I couldn't. There was a job to finish, and a flicker of guilt over Monroe's death adding fuel to my rage. Late afternoon, I saw it, a flicker of unnatural movement on a ridge high above me. The creature was perched on a rocky outcrop, its emaciated silhouette sharp against the setting sun. It wasn't tracking me, but watching, as if surveying its territory. That flicker of arrogance, that casual indifference, ignited something in me. It wasn't just a dangerous beast anymore. It was a mockery of everything I stood for. A threat, not only to me but to anyone unlucky enough to stumble into its hunting grounds. Taking a deep breath, I raised Monroe's rifle, sighting in on that impossibly long body. The first shot echoed through the valley. The creature jolted, its head snapping around. I fired a second time before it could pinpoint my location. This time, I heard a yelp of pain as my bullet tore through its flesh. It scrambled up the ridge, disappearing behind a tangle of boulders. I moved, skirting the base of the ridge, keeping out of sight but ready. There was blood on the rocks, a trail leading deeper into the mountains. The setting sun cast long shadows, turning any scrubby bush or rock formation into a grotesque, monstrous shape. I traded places with my prey. I was the hunter now. Following the blood trail wasn't easy. It twisted and turned, sometimes vanishing entirely, only to reappear on a patch of moss or a fallen tree. The forest was growing denser, the light fading with each step. Then the ground fell away, a sharp incline leading down towards a shadowed crevice. That's where I found its lair, a shallow cave carved into the bedrock. The stench that reached me was almost unbearable, a mix of rotting meat and something cloyingly sweet that turned my stomach. The cave opening was narrow, barely big enough for a person to crawl through on their belly. I hesitated, my hand gripping the flashlight taped to the rifle's barrel. To go in there was madness, suicide. That creature could be waiting just out of sight, ready to ambush me. But Monroe's bloodied face flashed before my eyes, hardening my resolve. This thing had caused enough death. I dropped to my knees, edged into the darkness, and flicked on the light. The beam cut through the gloom revealing piles of half-eaten carcasses, deer, some kind of mountain goat, and my breath hitched. Two human bodies, stripped to bone and yellowed teeth, lay discarded in the corner. The scientists. Something lunged at me from the darkness. I twisted, firing a shot instinctively. 
The bullet ripped through the creature's shoulder, sending it crashing against the cave wall. Its roar shook the stones above, and a shower of dust and debris rained down. I scrambled backward, blind in the sudden darkness after the flashlight flew from my hand. The creature screeched, scrambling around in the tight space, claws scrabbling against rock. I couldn't risk another shot, not in this enclosed cave. The echo or a ricochet could be just as lethal. It came again, a rush of claws and fetid breath. I grabbed the rifle barrel, using it to block a raking blow, feeling the vibration of those impossibly long claws through the steel. Somehow I managed to roll, slamming the butt of the rifle into the ground. The cave roof buckled, stones tumbling down, one of them striking the creature square on its skeletal head. It roared, a deafening, wounded sound, and thrashed wildly. I took my chance, slithering past it and out into the last sliver of twilight. I ran. I scrambled up the incline, not stopping until the sound of the creature's thrashing faded into the distance. When I finally collapsed against a tree, chest heaving, my body one giant bruise, I felt the full weight of what i just survived. It took me another day to navigate my way out of the mountains, back to civilization. The local authorities barely believed my mangled story when I finally flagged down a passing car. But somehow, they found the cave, the evidence of the creature's kills. Some men in suits, a different branch of the government, I suspected, came and carted it all off. Case closed, creature contained, or so they told me. They offered the standard spiel, relocation, new identity, a quiet life on a beach somewhere. I refused. I got back on that plane, went home to my wife, who looked at me with haunted eyes and a weariness that mirrored my own. We never really spoke about what happened. What do you even say? Some nights, I jolt awake in a cold sweat, the image of that skeletal thing, those glowing eyes searing my brain. My wife tells me I talk in my sleep, growl like a wounded animal. The truth is, part of me stayed back there in that forest. The part that wasn't afraid to become a monster to fight a monster. My name is Blake Palmer, and this happened to me in the spring of 2006. I'm a field operative for a black ops division of the CIA, the kind of guys they disavow if things go south. My job description has never included the words cryptid or undead, but life, apparently, has a twisted sense of humor. I'd been stationed deep undercover in rural Missouri, tracking some shady arms deals going down in a backwoods militia group. We're not talking duck hunters and weekend warriors here, but hardened survivalists, the kind who build bunkers and believe the apocalypse is right around the corner. The job itself was routine, nothing more than setting up surveillance, monitoring chatter. Until my third night out, when the routine took a very, very sharp turn down crazy town. I had the night shift, holed up in a cramped deer blind, thermal scope trained on the militia's ramshackle compound. Hours of boredom punctuated by bursts of activity, guys lugging crates, muffled conversations. Then, around 2 a.m., something moved out past the tree line. At first, I figured it was a stray deer. The thermal image was humanoid, but hunched over moving in an odd, jerky way. It got closer, and something about the elongated limbs, the too big head, sent a shiver down my spine. The thing stepped into the faint moonlight, and my muttered curse died in my throat. This wasn't a human, not anymore. I'd seen enough questionable autopsies for a lifetime when I was in medical school. This was a reanimated corpse, skin gray and shriveled, 
mouth hanging open in a silent snarl, and the eyes, empty pits of darkness. I fumbled for the radio, but the thing lunged, moving with inhuman speed. It slammed into the side of the blind, with splintering as its decayed hands tore at the flimsy structure. I fired a shot, more of a reflexive panic response than anything. The bullet tore through its shoulder, but it didn't even flinch. The blind was coming apart under the assault, and I had nowhere to run. Then, another sound, gunfire, not from my direction. The creature hissed, the sound like a punctured tire, and whirled around. Two figures emerged from the trees, the leader wielding a huge double-barreled shotgun. The stocky guy behind him shouted, Over here, you government stooge! Before I could process this turn of events, the shotgun roared. The blast knocked the creature backward, leaving a gaping hole in its chest. Somehow, it was still upright, gurgling and twitching in the dirt. I stumbled out of the collapsed blind, my side throbbing where a splinter of wood had caught me. Name's Jebediah, this is Elias. The man with the shotgun grunted in way of introduction. They looked like stereotypical mountain men, beards down to their chests, but their gear was all top-of-the-line military issue. Didn't think the feds knew about these fellers. Jebediah nodded at the twitching corpse. You hunt these things? I managed to ask. The whole situation was so far beyond my worldview that my brain was scrambling for purchase. Not hunt, son. Protect. Elias spoke for the first time, his voice surprisingly soft. These folks? Used to be neighbors, for the sickness got em. It slowly dawned on me. This wasn't just a crazy militia. They were some kind of self-styled guardians, protecting their town from whatever the hell turned folks into these shuffling nightmares. Out here, miles from anything resembling official help, they had to take matters into their own hands. How, how does this happen? My voice was barely a whisper. I'd seen the classified files, dissected the weird and unknown, and none of it prepared me for this. Elias shrugged, a grim set to his jaw. We call it the blight. Don't know how it started, but it's spreading, so like. Jebediah chuckled bitterly. Fed boy here looking like he might just puke up his guts. He slung his shotgun over his shoulder, motioning for me to follow. We gotta clear up this mess before sunrise. No telling what draws them out, but come daylight they'll find shelter. And that's how I ended up helping two backwoods hunters drag the rotting corpse to a clearing rigged with trip wires and what looked suspiciously like C4. They told me not to ask too many questions, something about preserving the delicate balance. I wanted to argue, to yell for backup for scientists to swarm the place, all the usual government protocol. But out here, watching Jebediah's weathered hand hit the detonator, it felt hollow. I spent the next few weeks in an odd limbo filing sanitized reports that didn't mention undead horrors getting debriefed by men in sterile suits who seemed more disturbed by my mention of backwoods hunters than the reanimated corpses. In between, I was shipped up north to help Jebediah and Elias fortify their perimeter against the growing blight. These fellers getting bolder. Jebediah grumbled as he reloaded his shotgun with a practiced motion. He and Elias had taught me how to handle their rough-and-ready arsenal how to track the creatures by the sickly sweet scent that hung in the air around them. It was a bizarre reality part special forces training, part gruesome country ghost story. Their little town was a bastion amidst a sea of decay. Barricaded streets, boarded up windows, people whose eyes carried both fear and a stubborn kind of defiance. They'd lost folks to the blight, lost parts of themselves, but their community remained. That alone felt like a small victory amidst the encroaching horror. Then came the night that changed everything. 
It started with an eerie silence, the kind that presses down on you with an almost physical weight. No sound of crickets, no rustling leaves, just an unnatural stillness hanging over the valley. They're organizing, Elias said, his words coming out tight and low. The firelight in his eyes reflected a fear far deeper than anything I'd seen him display before. We manned our posts atop the makeshift barricade. Hours ticked past with agonizing slowness. Then, a flicker of movement at the tree line. Not the shambling gait of a lone creature, but a coordinated approach. There were dozens of them, converging from all sides. The first wave crashed against the barricades. Elias' shotgun boomed, dropping two of the rotting figures before they could reach us. I opened fire, picking out targets in the darkness, the smell of cordite and decay choking the air. But there were too many, their decayed bodies clawing their way over the piles of their own fallen. Fall back! Jebediah yelled. He tossed something that landed near my feet, a flash of light and a deafening roar filling my ears. A flash bang. I'd heard of them, never imagined having to use one in the middle of nowhere against walking corpses. We retreated toward the center of town, covering each other with staggered bursts of gunfire. It was a fighting withdrawal, ugly and desperate. We couldn't hold them. Every flickering shadow looked like a potential attacker. Every muffled moan seemed to be whispering my own doom. I lost sight of Jebediah in the confusion, a knot of terror twisting in my gut. A decaying hand shot out from a darkened doorway, grabbing my ankle, dragging me into the inky blackness. I fired blindly, hearing a wet, gurgling sound as my bullet found its mark. I kicked free, scrambling back into the open. The church! Elias was yelling through the chaos, pointing toward the steeple visible in the distance. It made grim sense, elevated position, solid stone walls. A last stand, perhaps. We sprinted, dodging and weaving as the blighted figures pressed in on us. Reaching the church felt like an impossible feat the heavy wooden door slammed shut behind us, the silence inside a stark contrast to the snarls and moans coming from outside. We barricaded it with anything we could find, pews, a fallen crucifix, our dwindling hope. There was no sound of pursuit, just the chilling silence that stretched on and on. Had we fought them off? Were they waiting, trying to starve us out? My gaze landed on the stained glass windows, picturing those decayed hands breaking through, a grotesque mockery of the images of saints and angels. Suddenly, a thud against the door, followed by another. The flimsy barricade bowed inward. They're strong as damn oxen when they get riled up, Elias muttered, raising his shotgun again. I reached for my own weapon, my movements numb. We both knew there was only one way this ended. Another thud, harder this time. Wood splintered, and I saw a withered arm punch through the widening crack. That's when we heard it. A faint sound at first, growing louder by the second. Not the moans of the undead, but the rhythmic thumping of helicopter blades cutting through the night air. A spotlight swept the ground, illuminating the swarm of creatures surrounding the church and washing over us in a blinding beam. Then, a voice booming through a loudspeaker. This is the United States Army. Stand down and prepare for immediate extraction. Hope surged through me, a feeling almost as terrifying as the despair that had preceded it. It wasn't over. For now, at least. The aftermath was a whirlwind of medical quarantines, debriefs lasting longer than I had sleep, and the gnawing sense that the worst was yet to come. Jebediah and Elias vanished, presumably spirited away into some shadowy task force formed to deal with this new, terrible reality. 
My own superiors looked at me like I was some kind of tainted goods, an unreliable witness to an unbelievable catastrophe. I put in my resignation, refused their offers of desk jobs and heavily monitored psych evals, took a chunk of savings and bought myself a remote cabin nestled deep in the woods, high in the Appalachians. Doomsday preppers had the right idea, it turns out just the wrong enemy in mind. The solitude out here is both my prison and my sanctuary. I stockpiled weapons, supplies, everything learned from my time with Jebediah and Elias. Every night, I sit on my porch, shotgun within reach, listening to the rustle of the wind, straining my eyes toward the darkness at the edge of the clearing. Because you never know what— or who might come walking out of those woods. My name is Lucas Kane, and this happened to me on July 23, 2008. I'm an agent with the CIA, one of those guys who gets sent in when things get so weird even the regular agents wash their hands of it. Monsters like the one I encountered in the Everglades. Let's just say they don't make it into official briefings. The Everglades are a primordial place, a vast expanse of water, mangroves, and some bleached sawgrass stretching to the horizon. Alligators slide beneath the murky water, exotic birds shriek overhead, and the air thrums with the buzz of a billion insects. A place designed to remind you just how small and insignificant humans are in the grand scheme of things. Officially, I was sent to investigate suspected eco-terrorism. Poachers, smugglers, the usual swamp rats causing trouble. The reality? Well, that was far more disturbing. Locals were whispering about mutilated livestock, mangled beyond any known predator attack. And then there were the disappearances, hunters and hikers vanishing without a trace in the tangled waterways. Those vanishings sent a shiver down my spine, a prickle of unease the years of training couldn't fully suppress. I teamed up with a park ranger named Anya, a tough, sun-weathered woman with a no-nonsense attitude and a haunted look in her eyes. She'd grown up in the swamps, knew the territory like the back of her hand. Anya didn't believe in old wives' tales, but there was an edge to her voice when she relayed the chilling stories passed down by generations of her people. We spent most of a week combing through the swamp, finding nothing except oppressive heat and clouds of mosquitoes. Locals cast us wary glances, reluctant to break their code of silence about what lurked in the depths. Just when I was ready to chalk it up as another overblown conspiracy theory, we got our first solid lead. A hysterical family stumbled out of the mangroves, babbling about their fishing trip turned nightmare. Their boat was half sunken, shredded as if clawed by some massive animal. More disturbing was their description of the creature they swore had attacked them a hulking, amphibious beast with glowing eyes. After calming them down, Anya and I went to investigate. The boat was a wreck, just as they described. But it was the smell that hit me first, a rank, swampy odor overlaid with something sharp and metallic. Blood. Lots of it, staining the splintered wood. Whatever had attacked the boaters, it hadn't been an alligator. We set up camp at the edge of the sawgrass. Anya and I falling into a tense silence broken only by the croaking of frogs and the rustle of creatures unseen in the darkness. The feeling of being watched prickled the back of my neck. I knew, instinctively, that we were no longer the hunters, but the hunted. Nightfall transformed the swamp. Each rustle and splash seemed amplified, every shadow a potentially deadly threat. Then, just as the last light was draining from the sky, we heard it a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Anya and I exchanged a grim look. The hunt was on. We moved cautiously, 
flashlights cutting arcs through the gloom. The creature was stalking us, intelligent and patient. I caught glimpses of its movement in the underbrush, flashes of yellow eyes reflecting back the pale moonlight. Suddenly it lunged from the mangroves, a monstrous eruption of scales and claws. Its size was staggering, easily twice the height of a man, and built like a tank. Its skin was leathery, mottled with shades of green and brown, camouflaging it perfectly in its environment. A massive, elongated snout ended in rows of razor-sharp teeth. Anya fired first, her rifle barking in the stillness. The creature seemed more annoyed than hurt, letting out a deafening roar that vibrated through the swamp. That roar was my first mistake. It drew attention. They came from the water, a whole pack of them. Sleek bodies slithered through the murky depths, glowing eyes fixed on us with predatory hunger. We were surrounded. Run! I shouted at Anya, knowing even as I said it that it was futile. The creatures hit us like a wave, claws tearing and teeth gnashing. Anya screamed, her gun clattering to the muddy ground. I fought back desperately firing wildly into the thrashing bodies. One of the creatures latched onto my leg, its jaws crushing down on my calf. I screamed, the pain blinding, and kicked out frantically. Somehow, I managed to scramble back, dragging my injured leg, leaving a trail of blood in my wake. Behind me, I heard the sounds of Anya's struggle cut short with a sickening gurgle. There was no time for grief, only survival. I stumbled through the swamp, every instinct screaming at me to get out, to escape. The creatures pursued, the sounds of their splashing growing closer. I could smell their fetid breath, hear their clicking claws on the roots and decaying vegetation. Any hope that I might outrun them was fading. I tripped, my bad leg giving out, and tumbled into the water. The shock of its surprising coldness momentarily cleared some of the pain-induced fog from my brain. Ahead I saw the twisted, half-submerged roots of a massive mangrove. Desperate, I lunged for it, hauling myself into the tangle of branches. I clung to the mangrove roots, my breath harsh and ragged in the swampy air. The creatures circled below, the water roiling with their movement. Their yellow eyes glinted up at me, burning with malevolent intelligence. They didn't seem inclined to follow me into the tangle of roots. Perhaps their size worked against them here. A small sliver of hope flickered in the crushing despair. My injured leg throbbed with agonizing intensity. I ripped a strip from my shirt and fashioned a crude tourniquet, gritting my teeth against waves of white-hot pain. If I didn't get out of here soon, infection or blood loss would finish what those monsters had started. The creatures, perhaps sensing my weakening state, grew bolder. One lunged forward, snapping its jaws just short of my dangling feet. Another attempted to scale the massive roots, only to slip back with an angry hiss. With a jolt of dread, I realized the water level was slowly rising high tide. Soon, my precarious refuge would be well within reach of those razor-sharp claws. Panic flared inside me, hot and blinding. I had to move, but where? The mangrove stood alone, an island amidst a vast expanse of water and sawgrass. Despair wrapped icy fingers around my heart. Then, through the haze of pain, I saw it, a flicker of light in the distance. Not the eerie glow of the creature's eyes, but a steady beam. A boat. Hope surged, hot and desperate. I cupped my hands around my mouth and shouted, my voice hoarse and weak against the vast emptiness of the swamp. The boat didn't change course. Either they hadn't heard or didn't care about some random yelling man-man in the middle of nowhere. I shouted again, adding a desperate wave of my good arm. 
Still no response. Just as despair threatened to consume me again, the boat shifted course, turning slowly in my direction. Salvation. It took an agonizingly long time for the small airboat to reach me. Each minute felt like an hour, the creatures below growing more restless with every inch the water rose. I thought I heard gunfire, distant and muffled, followed by the fading echoes of those monstrous roars. Perhaps someone else was out there, buying me precious time. When the airboat finally drew close, two figures leaned over the edge. Hang tight! A burly, bearded man yelled. We saw the whole thing. Damn swamp monsters! Relief washed over me so strong it nearly buckled my knees. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't alone. With their help, I managed to clamber aboard, collapsing in an exhausted heap. As the airboat sped away, I saw the mangroves sink below the waterline, the predators swarming over the last of my sanctuary. The aftermath was a blur. There were paramedics, a dingy field hospital, a whirlwind of official questions that I couldn't fully answer. They found Anya's remains, or what little the creatures had left of her. I never learned what happened to the boaters who helped rescue me. The official report chalked the whole thing up to a freak alligator attack, with my trauma-filled ramblings about a pack of monsters dismissed as hallucinations. I was medically discharged from the CIA. The gnawing ache in my leg is a constant reminder of that night, and my mangled calf might as well be branded with the truth the government will never acknowledge. Most nights, I lie awake, the guttural roars of the creatures and Anya's dying screams echoing in my ears. Sleep offers no respite, only vivid nightmares of clawed hands dragging me back down into the murky depths. I moved into a high-rise apartment in the heart of a bustling city, steel and concrete, and as far from the natural world as I could get. I covered the windows with blackout blinds, never quite able to banish the feeling of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. Someone else at the agency took over my old case files, the ones that detail encounters too bizarre, too horrifying for the official records. Sometimes I wonder if they found other victims, other survivors like me. Most times I push the thought away. It's safer not to know. The creatures of the Everglades still prowl their watery domain, unseen and unacknowledged by the wider world. And I, I survive. I exist. Some might even call it living. But I know the truth. The monsters are real. And one fateful, blood-soaked night, they left their mark on me, body and soul. Sometimes, late at night when the city seems to fall silent, I swear I can hear the distant rustling of the sawgrass and the soft splash of scaled bodies in the water. And I know it's only a matter of time until the swamp creatures come calling again. My name is Marcus Wells, and this happened to me in the spring of 2010. I'm a covert ops specialist, the fixer, they send when the CIA needs problems handled outside official channels. Wife thinks I've got a boring desk job, bless her heart. Most of my assignments, I don't tell her about. This one, I still haven't figured out how. It started with a cryptic message. Wyoming, backwater town called Willow Creek, reports of a disturbance, too weird for local law enforcement to grapple with. I landed at the tiny regional airport in a rented SUV, already regretting leaving my normal gear behind. Orders were to blend in, observe, avoid escalation at all costs. Yeah, right. Willow Creek was one of those places that gives you the creeps in broad daylight. Crumbling Main Street storefronts, everyone looking at you like you just stepped out of a flying saucer. 
The kind of town where folks vanish, and the ones left behind know not to ask too many questions. First stop, the sheriff's office. Sheriff Hayes was a grizzled old bear of a man, smelled faintly of stale coffee and ingrained distrust. His story went as expected, reports of missing livestock, mutilated carcasses drained of blood. Nothing they couldn't pass off as a mountain lion, if not for the local stories about howls that rattled the windows at night and glimpses of something unnatural lurking in the shadows. I spent my days wandering the outskirts of town, marking potential entry points on a battered map, looking like your average lost hiker. Willow Creek sat at the edge of the Shoshone National Forest, miles of pines stretching out in every direction, the perfect hiding spot for anything that didn't want to be found. Nights were worse. I'd hole up in a cheap motel room, staring out at the swaying trees and trying to drown out the scratching sounds at the door that I refused to acknowledge were real. Third week in, I went for a night hike. Bad idea probably fueled by cheap bourbon and the creeping sense of dread. Needed some proof for the higher-ups, a blurry photo, anything less dismissible than gut instinct and tall tales. The forest was different at night. Alive like it was holding its breath and watching me. Snapping twigs, faint rustles, and always that damn scratching. My rational brain kept saying bear, or... Raccoon, but something primal in me was screaming to get out. That's when I saw the eyes. Two pinpricks of amber fire reflecting the beam of my flashlight, high off the ground. A big cat, maybe, but the way it moved, smooth, too fluid for an animal. I froze. Slowly, I lowered the flashlight beam, and that's when I saw the full shape. The thing was hunched over easily seven feet tall even in that crouch. Skeletal, with grayish, leathery skin stretched tight over bone. It had a wolfish sort of head, but the muzzle was too long, the teeth too numerous, and the eyes, those damn eyes, soulless and intelligent. It tilted its head, studying me with chilling curiosity, like a scientist examining a lab rat. Adrenaline punched through me, hot and cold at once. It sprang forward in a blur of motion, and I dove, more by instinct than conscious thought. I hit the dirt hard, rolling and scrambling frantically through the undergrowth as it screeched in rage behind me. I lost it, eventually, stumbling back towards the main road half-dead from terror. It didn't follow, as if it was toying with me or or herding me back towards the town. I found my SUV and floored it back to the motel, hands shaking so hard I could barely get the key in the ignition. Sleep was impossible. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that hunched, shadowed form, the sickening gleam of its predator's eyes. That was the night I made the call no CIA field agent ever wants to make. Do we need backup and evac, like yesterday call? They told me to sit tight, that a team was en route. Didn't matter. It was already too late. Around three in the morning, I heard the sirens. Then the screams. It wasn't subtle anymore, wasn't satisfied with livestock. My room overlooked the town square, and what I saw made me wish for the blissful ignorance of sleep. The creatures, a whole damn pack of them, at least a dozen, were swarming the town. Humanoid yet horrifically warped, skeletal beasts ripping into houses and dragging people out into the streets. The screams were bone-chilling, cutting off with sickening abruptness. My gun was useless at this distance. I watched, paralyzed by horror as one of the creatures ripped Sheriff Hayes apart with its bare hands, spraying the cobblestones with blood. Then it turned its head. It looked directly at me, those hellish eyes locking onto mine even across the distance. There was no mistaking it. 
This wasn't an animalistic rampage. It was a calculated slaughter. I was a witness, and they were cleaning house. Panic surged through me, the room suddenly a claustrophobic cage. I grabbed my go bag, emergency supplies stuffed alongside the tools of my trade. My standard issue sidearm was no use here, but I had a few tricks up my sleeve, stuff strictly off the books. Every dark ops specialist keeps a contingency plan, even for moments when you feel like the damn contingency. I kicked out the window. It wasn't a long drop to a disused storeroom roof. Heart pounding in my ears, I scrambled across and dropped down into a garbage-strewn alleyway, the stench a welcome distraction from the screams still echoing faintly from the town square. My plan was simple, idiotic, and the only hope in hell, burn the beasts out. I set a timer on the incendiary device, small and innocuous until triggered then sprinted. Willow Creek's buildings were thankfully old, mostly wood, dry as tinder. If I could lead those things into the right spot and time it perfectly, chaos was my only advantage. I ran, not looking back. The screeches were getting closer, their inhuman speed outmatching mine. Adrenaline twisted in my gut, part fear, part of a cold resolve I hadn't felt in years. This wasn't some faceless enemy halfway across the world. This was here, on American soil, devouring decent people like those old folks at the diner who'd treated the strange out-of-towner with gruff kindness. I reached the abandoned general store, kicked in the rotten door, and ducked inside. My pursuers were less than a block behind. The inside was a dusty, flammable tomb. I sprinted to the back, setting a trail of accelerant, standard black ops kit for when fire was your friend. Just as I triggered the incendiary on the way out, I heard them enter the store. Three of them, snarling, sniffing the air. The scent of accelerant must have hit them then, because there was a split second of hesitation, a flicker of something like confusion in those soulless eyes. Then... With a wrathful screech, they charged. I threw myself out the back way just as the fire roared to life. The blast wave nearly knocked me off my feet, the heat searing my exposed skin. I didn't look back, just ran until my lungs screamed and my vision blurred. Behind me, the store was an inferno, the blaze spreading with unnatural speed. When I finally collapsed behind some half-destroyed barn, choking for breath and shaking uncontrollably, I allowed myself a glance over my shoulder. Willow Creek was burning. Through the flickering haze of the spreading fire, I saw monstrous silhouettes twisting in the flames. Howls mixed with the crackle of the blaze, not victory cries, but screams of torment. For a moment... An insane surge of triumph flared within me. Then came the realization. I couldn't have killed them all. And whatever survived, well, they wouldn't forget. My evac team found me two days later, amid the smoldering ruins, looking ten years older. The official report was a devastating wildfire, tragic but sadly common in the arid west. No mention of the creatures— of the blood staining the cobblestones, of the faces of good people twisted in masks of terror. They put me through the ringer, questioning, psyche vals, the whole nine yards. Finally, they shipped me back to D.C. with a hefty dose of amnesia-inducing sedatives and a quiet suggestion to consider retirement. They think I snapped. Maybe I did. Part of me wishes I was blissfully unaware back in the world of shadowy enemies and morally gray decisions that once felt so complex. But now, looking over my shoulder at every rustle of leaves on my backwoods jogging trail, I know better. The aftermath, it haunts me. Not just in nightmares, but in every unanswered question. What were those things? Where did they come from? How many more nests are out there? 
biding their time. I made calls, dug into back channels, risked my career and my sanity to uncover some sliver of the truth. Nothing. No other sightings like Willow Creek, not that were made public anyway. I've got a cabin now upstate. Reinforced walls, security system straight out of a paranoid spy thriller. My ex-wife thinks I've finally lost it, bless her heart. My nights are spent cleaning my guns, the ones the CIA let me keep, and the ones they don't know about. I watch the tree line. I listen to the rustle of the wind and convince myself it's just the damn raccoons again. Because somewhere out there, those soulless eyes are watching back. And I know, with the same chilling certainty I felt on that blood-soaked night in Willow Creek, they haven't forgotten me either. Maybe they're regrouping, or evolving, or maybe they're just waiting for the right order to come down. I'll be ready. Might not be enough to stop them, but by God, when those bastards decide to come out of the shadows again, I'll make sure I leave a few more scars on their kind before I go down. My name is Miles Harrison, and this happened to me in the spring of 2012. I'm a covert ops specialist for the CIA. That's the cleaned-up version. The truth is I handled the dirty work no official report will ever acknowledge. Spent half my life overseas, in the shadows, so when they tell me to pack my bags for a domestic assignment, I know something's gone seriously wrong. The briefing was short and unsettling. Outbreaks of extreme violence in a stretch of remote Appalachian forest land. Multiple missing persons reports. Mostly out-of-town hikers and campers the kind easily dismissed as accidents, if not for the sheer volume. My gut instinct said drug cartel, gone feral off-grid. Seen things like that in South America. But this was America and my superiors were jumpy, whispering about bioterrorism and the like. I set up camp near the edge of the forest, an old fishing shack on a barely used road. Locals weren't much help. Tight-lipped, looking at me like I was the threat, not whatever lurked in those woods. They called the disappearances, the hush, folks go in, nobody comes out, no bodies ever found. Spent my first few days doing recon. The forest was eerily silent. Not the normal chirps and rustles of life, but a heavy, oppressive quiet that settled over you like a damp blanket. Even in the height of summer, there was a coldness in the air that made my skin crawl. A couple of times I heard noises. Shuffling sounds the crack of a branch, but too far away to pinpoint. It felt like being watched, a prickly sensation of unseen eyes tracking my every move. I started leaving trail markers, bits of colored fabric tied to trees, a broken twig propped against a rock. Just little things, but the kind of savvy tracker like myself could notice if they were disturbed. Then, on my fifth night out, something changed. An animal, I told myself at first big one. Maybe a bear. The low growls were guttural, laced with something I wouldn't label hunger. It circled my cabin, close enough that I could hear it breathing, feel the vibrations of its footsteps against the worn floorboards. I holed up inside, rifle trained on the door. Adrenaline thrummed through me, the taste of copper in my mouth. Part of me, the old operative part, was coldly assessing the perimeter, the weak points, how long I could hold out. And then it let loose a howl, a high-pitched screech that split the night and made my blood run cold. This wasn't a bear. It wasn't any damn thing I could name. The sun rose, and the noises stopped. I ventured out cautiously, weapon at the ready. All was still, but the cabin had been marked— Shallow claw marks across the door, 
and splatters of something dark and sticky that I didn't want to identify. I spent the day setting traps, the kind used on big game in Africa, and rigging the perimeter with motion sensor lights. My hands moved efficiently, but my mind raced. This assignment went way beyond my pay grade. I needed backup, experts, anyone who could explain what in the fresh hell I was up against. The radio signal was spotty out here. I finally managed to get a message out, garbled, full of static, but enough to get the point across that the situation was officially out of control. The reply was curt, promising a team en route. Estimated arrival, two days. Two days with my back against the wall, alone against whatever stalked these woods. Night fell, and it brought terror with it. My traps remained undisturbed, a testament to whatever creature was hunting me being too cunning, or too unnatural, to be caught like an animal. The noises were different this time, more purposeful. I picked up movement on two corners of the cabin simultaneously. Then the roof. A low rasping sound, like nails across slate. I fired at the ceiling, more out of panic than strategy. Wood splintered, revealing a glimpse of the night sky and, dear God, two eyes glowing crimson in the darkness. I scrambled back as something heavy landed on the floorboards above me, causing the whole cabin to groan in protest. Panic fueled me now. I threw a flare out the window, the burst of light momentarily cutting through the gloom. It was then that I truly saw it, a blur of bone-white flesh streaked with dried blood, a skeletal torso balanced on impossibly long limbs that ended in vicious claws. Its head, it had the shape of a human skull, but stretched and twisted into something wrong, a gaping maw lined with rows of serrated teeth. I fired at it. Bullets ripped into its form, and it howled in rage, but didn't go down. It tore through the roof, escaping with a final screech that echoed in my ears long after the maddening silence had returned. The aftermath of the attack was pure chaos. The flare had lit some of the undergrowth, sending flames racing through the dry brush. I had to move, get out ahead of the inferno. Grabbing whatever gear I could salvage, I bolted out the back door as the cabin started to collapse in on itself. The fire at my back offered some twisted protection. I doubted the creature would risk the flames in pursuit, but I couldn't linger. I sprinted through the trees, the smoke and darkness blinding me, forcing me to navigate by instinct and a fading familiarity with the layout of the land from my initial recon runs. My trail markers, they were gone. Torn down, destroyed, or consumed by the blaze. I was well and truly lost, with whatever beast I'd enraged somewhere out there, biding its time in the night. The firestorm raged for hours, turning a swathe of the forest into a charred wasteland. Come dawn, I found myself on a barren, rocky outcrop and did a shaky headcount. I'd lost the trail cams, most of my food rations, and was down to a few precious rounds of ammunition. On any other op, this would have sent me into crisis prep mode. But after the night I'd just endured, there was a grim acceptance. Standard survival protocols didn't matter when the enemy wasn't human. I spent a chilling day nestled in a crag, the distant smoke a constant reminder of the destruction I'd left behind. It gnawed at me, the thought of the locals caught in the crossfire. Were they all right? What if the creature, driven from its usual hunting grounds, turned its rage on them? I used what was left of the daylight to relocate, found a cave in a nearby ridge, defensible, a good vantage point. It seemed untouched, no signs of blood or recent habitation. Yet I couldn't shake the sense of trespass, like I was barging into a predator's den. Night descended, bringing the noises back. Not the brazen attack of before, 
but a more cautious circling. It knew where I was. I barricaded the cave entrance as best I could, a pathetic shield against the strength I'd witnessed firsthand. My only advantage, this place was tight, limiting its maneuverability. If it came for me here, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't go down without a fight. The standoff lasted hours. I sat in the darkness, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands, eyes glued to the slivers of moonlight coming through the barricade. Every rustle of dry leaves, every snap of a distant twig, sent my heart thudding. It came not through attack, but subterfuge. A sound directly above my cave, a scraping, like claws against stone. It was on the roof, trying to get in from a different angle. I aimed, fired, and the noise ceased abruptly, followed by a heavy thump. Silence stretched on. Had I hit it? Killed it? I didn't dare hope. Something stank outside the cave, a rotting, fetid odor that turned my stomach. First light came, and cautiously, I moved the barricade. The creature lay just outside, sprawled on the rocks. In death, it looked smaller, almost pathetic. Sunlight revealed the extent of the damage I'd inflicted. Several bullet holes peppered its torso, one had pierced an eye socket. But what made my breath hitch was the wound on the underside of its neck, not a gunshot, but a long, ragged slash, like something else had clawed its way through its throat. I never got my backup team. By the time I made my way down to a ranger station, half-starved and babbling a lunatic's account, the only evidence I could offer was my mangled radio and the decaying corpse rapidly being dismissed as a bare carcass mangled by coyotes. The official's eyes said it all, wilderness shock, battle fatigue, maybe even a touch of pity. My return to civilization was a nightmare of its own. Classified debriefs psyche vals, the cold analysis of men in suits who saw a traumatized agent, not the unnatural horror I'd faced. They offered me reassignment, a quiet desk job where no one would question my sanity. I turned it down, told them if they saw monsters in that forest, they could damn well find someone else to fight them. I sold my old condo, bought a used truck, and headed north, far away from the oppressive hush of those Appalachians. Found a tiny cabin for sale in the Alaskan backcountry. It's a different kind of isolation out here, clean and harsh in its vastness. They have bears too, but the mundane kind, the kind you can track and anticipate. Most nights, I sleep soundly, lulled by the wind and the creak of old wood. But some nights... I wake up in a cold sweat, the smell of decay filling my nostrils. My rifle's prop beside the door, just in case. And when the wind whistles through the distant peaks, it sounds a hell of a lot like that same bone-chilling howl that haunts my nightmares. Because the men in suits, they never got the full truth. That thing out in the woods, it wasn't the first of its kind. It wasn't alone. My name is Marcus Webb, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I'm a CIA field agent, though you won't find my name on any official roster. C. I work for a deep cover group within the agency, tasked with things the government would rather disavow if they leaked. We're the shadow behind the shadow, so to speak. They sent me and Riley Jenkins, my usual partner, to check out rumblings in the Mojave Desert. Rumors of weapons being tested out in the deep backcountry, far from prying eyes. Nothing official, of course, mostly whispers on the fringe websites and half-baked conspiracy forums. But sometimes, there's a grain of truth amid the madness. We were there to unearth that. Riley's a mountain of a man, ex-marine, but brawn to my brains. 
he wasn't big on this op. Waste of time chasing ghost stories in the sand. He kept grumbling, kicking up dust with his oversized boots. But hey, orders are orders. We had a rough terrain truck loaded with enough gear for a month-long survival trip and a set of coordinates that marked the supposed hot zone. We set up camp at the edge of the search area. The desert here was harsh, all unforgiving rock and stunted shrubs clinging to life in the dry air. Miles and miles of the same, stretching out under that oppressive, bowl-of-the-world sky. At least the nights were spectacular out here, stars blazing so bright you felt like you could reach out and pluck them. Three days in, things went weird. We were about to call it quits, ready to write this off as a wild goose chase, when our motion sensors triggered in the dead of night. I grabbed my night vision goggles and my rifle, Riley right behind me, muttering a litany of imaginative curses. What we saw made all the hair on my neck stand on end. It wasn't a jeep load of militia wannabes, like we half expected. Hell, it wasn't even human. A hulking shape lumbered toward our campsite, silhouetted against the moon. Even distorted through the goggles, it sent a primal shiver down my spine. The thing moved in a bizarre, jittering way, like its limbs were too long, its joints all wrong. It looked almost emaciated, with taut leathery skin pulled tight over bone. The head, well, it looked like a damn skull perched on that gangly body, eyes glowing a sickly amber in the night, teeth a jagged mess in a too wide mouth. There was no hesitation, no animal stealth, just a single-minded, hungry charge right toward us. What the actual hell? Riley managed before he opened fire. The thing dodged the first few shots, impossibly agile. Then it hissed, a spine-chilling sound that was neither animal nor human. Riley lowered his rifle. That ain't natural, man, he breathed out. I tried radioing HQ, but got only static. Were we being jammed? We were too far out for some stray signal interference. As if it knew it was cut off, the creature lunged. The first blow knocked Riley off his feet, sending his gun flying. He barely got an arm up before those elongated claws ripped into his shoulder. Riley screamed, a raw, guttural sound that died as abruptly as it began. I caught a glimpse of the creature dragging him, kicking weakly, into the darkness before my brain took over. I ran, my pulse a frantic drumbeat. I wasn't ashamed to admit it. Pure terror pumped adrenaline through my veins. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't meant to walk this earth. I didn't stop until I reached the truck, fumbling with the keys, my fingers slick with a mix of sweat and something else I didn't want to identify. The engine roared to life. I floored the gas pedal, tearing out of the camp. I saw movement in the rearview mirror, that loping, bone-jarring run, coming after me. I kept driving, the gas gauge dropping alarmingly fast, the headlights cutting a swathe through the empty desert night. By morning, I'd reached a highway. I drove until I hit the first town with an operational phone booth, and finally contacted HQ. I told them everything, the creature, Riley, my voice broke as I relayed the incident. They listened, the silence on the other end of the line thick with disbelief. My report triggered a whole flurry of activity. Choppers, satellite scans, teams of heavily armed guys dropped into that godforsaken corner of the desert. They found our trash campsite, signs of the struggle. No body ever. The higher-ups chalked it up to a rogue bear, an attack fueled by desperation and hunger. It was all neat and sanitized in their official reports, no mention of glowing eyes, impossible speed, or the bone-deep chill that lingered in my memory. Riley's name got slapped with a missing-in-action label. 
just another casualty to be buried in red tape and forgotten. They sent me to the agency shrink, tried to poke and prod at my trauma until they either broke me or were satisfied I wasn't a total lunatic. The nightmares didn't help my case. That skeletal shape looming over me in the dark, Riley's bloodied face, the sound of his scream cutting off in that desolate silence. I spent weeks drifting, half alive. I'd wake up in a sweat, gasping for air, convinced the creature was crouched in the corner of my sterile apartment. They put me on leave, but my forced downtime didn't do much in the way of healing. Then came the call that jarred me back to some semblance of life. They'd found something. Out in New Mexico, a tiny town tucked in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, folks were whispering about livestock disappearing, mutilated bodies found near the treeline. It set off all my internal alarm bells. My superiors weren't convinced, blamed everything from drug cartels to rabid coyotes. Me? I knew better. I packed a bag and drove north, ignoring their frantic calls to return to base. Screw protocol. I hadn't signed up to watch innocent people get torn to shreds while my bosses stuffed their heads in the sand. I found the place, barely a speck on the map, all dusty roads and faded storefronts. The locals were skittish, throwing suspicious glances my way. There was a darkness hanging over this town, a heavy feeling of fear simmering just under the surface of forced normality. I rented a rundown cabin on the outskirts, close enough to the foothills to keep tabs on things, far enough to avoid prying eyes. The disappearances continued. A teenage hiker, a rancher, folks who ventured a tad too far into the trees, drawn by whatever the creature was leaving as bait. I scouted the terrain on my own, armed to the teeth. It was a waiting game now. The locals started turning on each other. Paranoia ate them up from the inside, whispering about cults and outsiders and the devil himself loose in their woods. One night, I watched from the edge of the trees as they formed an angry mob, torches casting flickering shadows against the ramshackle buildings. Talk of a witch hunt sent a chill down my spine. This whole town was about to unravel. That's when the creature made its appearance again. Not in the shadows like last time. It stepped boldly out onto the darkened main street, the yellow glow of its eyes sweeping over the startled crowd. The mob turned its fury toward this new target. Their panicked shouts mixed with gunshots echoing off the mountains. I ran too, not at the creature, but into the heart of the chaos. These people needed a distraction, a way out. I tossed a few improvised smoke bombs, the thick gray haze obscuring the street, forcing the crowd to break formation. Then I saw a flash of movement, the creature launching itself at an old woman too slow to flee. I tackled her just as those monstrous claws struck, raking my back but I barely felt the sting. My gun roared in the confines of the street, bullets slamming into the beast. It twisted, not dead but wounded. The yellow eyes fixed on me, and for the first time I felt true fear. No animal looks at you like that, with something akin to hatred. It knew I was a threat. My gun clicked empty. This was it. The end. Suddenly, a blur of motion slammed into the creature from the side. It was a huge black dog, snarling and snapping, all teeth and muscle and blind fury. The creature hissed, trying to dislodge this unexpected attacker. And in that moment of chaos, I had a window. I scrambled up, shouting for the townsfolk to run, to find shelter. Some listened, most were too terrified to react. The dog kept the creature occupied, snarling and biting, giving me just enough time to reach the old woman and drag her to safety behind an overturned truck. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the dog darted back into the alleyways, 
disappearing as quickly as it had arrived. The creature, bleeding from several wounds, turned and fled, vanishing into the smoke. The aftermath was a whirlwind of questions, hushed whispers, trembling fingers pointing at me. I left the town the next day. They had their miracle, a stranger and a mystery dog driving off whatever horror had plagued them. My wounds needed attention, but an ER doc could ask questions I couldn't afford to answer. They never found the creature, not that time. I keep tabs on the news feeds, scanning for reports from remote towns, any sign of those telltale disappearances and mutilated bodies. It's a morbid visual, but I've got no other life to return to. The CIA finally discharged me, some made-up medical excuse. I'm a ghost now, existing in seedy motels and back roads, always a step ahead of whatever haunts the dark corners of this country. The nightmares aren't as vivid these days, but I sleep with a gun under my pillow and one I always open. Because I know, somewhere out there, that creature's healing, biding its time. And one day, our paths will cross again. My name is David Stone. This happened to me in the spring of 1994. I work for the CIA. I'm one of the few agents that work in the Special Activities Center, the paramilitary arm of the CIA. We're always involved in dangerous missions. I started in a clandestine program, where we track drug cartels and armed smugglers. It was a nasty line of work, but it prepared me for when I was brought into the Special Activities Center. In 94, I was sent to a remote part of the Appalachian Mountains in western Virginia. Our intelligence had picked up whispers of illicit activity, weapons testing, of all things. Now, it's not unusual to hear rumors of militia nuts playing soldier in the backwoods, but something felt different. Higher caliber, you might say. Our mission was to infiltrate, recon, and report back. My partner was Allison Parks, a tough-as-nails former army ranger-turned-agent. We'd worked together on a few ops, and I trusted her with my life. Allison and I arrived in a beat-up pickup truck, looking like any two locals taking an extended camping trip. We spent a few days scoping out the area, mapping out rough trails and identifying the most likely spots for trouble. The terrain was rugged, heavily forested, and crisscrossed by ravines, perfect for concealing anything you didn't want found. After a week, we pinpointed the hotbed, a cluster of abandoned cabins tucked deep into a fold of the mountains. It looked deserted, but the hair stood up on the back of my neck. We stayed on the outskirts, observing. No movement during the day, but come nightfall, we spotted a lone figure hauling a canvas tarp into one of the cabins. I couldn't make out details, just the shadow of a tall, gangly person. The next morning, we split up to get better angles. Allison took the high ground, while I skirted around to the back, trying to avoid any traps or alarms. The cabins were in even worse shape up close, wood rotted, windows missing. It smelled damp, like something hadn't been aired out in years. Then, a noise, a scraping sound, coming from inside the nearest cabin. I drew my weapon and edged towards the door. The scrape came again, followed by a low, inhuman rumble. It wasn't speech, more a guttural growl. My heart hammered a wild rhythm. I didn't want to believe what my brain was screaming at me. Couldn't be. The moment of hesitation probably saved my life. The door exploded outwards, and I dove sideways. Something huge and impossibly fast hurtled past, shattering the rotting wood. It was a blur of matted fur and bone-white claws. I scrambled up, firing blindly, the gunshots echoing through the trees. 
The creature roared, a sound that ripped through my head like a rusted chainsaw. It turned, and I got my first clear look. Lord, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. Tall, at least eight feet, but hunched over, with gangly limbs that could have snapped me like a twig. Its muzzle, twisted in a permanent snarl, was lined with jagged teeth like shards of yellow glass. And the eyes, deep black pits that seemed to suck in all light. If there was any intelligence there, it was buried under a mountain of rage. The creature charged again. I dodged, but felt one of those rake-like claws tear across my arm. Pain seared up to my shoulder, and my vision swam. I staggered back, firing again and again. It seemed to slow, but not stop. Then came a scream from above, Allison yelling my name. The creature looked up, giving me a precious second to scramble back towards the trees. Allison, run! I shouted. She didn't need telling twice her figure bolted from the ridge, with the creature bounding after her like some grotesque hound. I didn't stop to think. I ran, crashing through the underbrush, ignoring the burning pain in my arm. The roar was replaced by Allison's panic yells, followed by a sickening, wet crack, and then her scream cut off abruptly. I kept running, fueled by a frantic mixture of rage and terror. I didn't know where I was going, just away, away from that, that thing. After what felt like hours, I collapsed gasping by a creek. My arm throbbed, the ragged wound oozing blood. I was lost, alone, and the thing from the cabin was still out there. It didn't seem real, like a nightmare brought to life. Night fell, thick and oppressive, filled only with the croaks of frogs and the rustle of leaves and the relentless wind. Every snap of a twig made me jump, heart pounding. I knew I couldn't stay there. The creature was probably tracking me, its sense of smell keener than a bloodhound's. I had to move, make myself a harder target. Using the barest sliver of moonlight, I staggered upstream the icy water numbing my wounded arm. Exhaustion dragged me down, but I kept going, images of Allison and the unholy creature fueling my desperation. Dawn found me curled up in some bushes, shivering despite the rising sun. My mind raced. Was this some genetic experiment gone horribly wrong? A bioweapon prototype let loose? I had no way of answering that not out here. What I didn't know was that I had to get out, report back. If that thing wasn't contained, God knows what chaos it could cause. Luck was with me. A few hours later, I stumbled onto a deer trail. This terrain was harsh, but I knew people sometimes hunted here. I followed the trail, my hope blooming with every step. It felt like days before I spotted the edge of the woods, but my heart sank when I saw what lay beyond. Instead of a road or any sign of civilization, a narrow river snaked through the foothills, choked with fog. Where the hell was I? Suddenly, a flicker of movement on the far bank caught my eye. A figure was crouched there, almost hidden by the mist. Relief washed over me, then evaporated as I realized the person was way too tall and hunched over, even at this distance. No human moved like that. Panic shot through me. The creature had found me. I turned and plunged back into the trees, running blindly, not caring about noise or direction. My breaths came in ragged gasps as I tore through thorny vines and tripped over exposed roots. A guttural roar echoed behind me, closer, too close. The ground fell away, and I tumbled head first down an embankment. My head bounced off a rock, and darkness swallowed me. I came to with a splitting headache and the taste of dirt in my mouth. It was dusk. My stomach churned, and my arm throbbed with a fiery intensity. Infection, no doubt. 
I had to move, but where? Back up the embankment seemed suicidal. Then, through the trees, I saw a glint of metal, a rusty old truck half-submerged in the river. A stroke of desperate luck. Maybe the keys were still inside, maybe the engine still worked. It was a slim hope, but better than passively waiting for the creature to finish me off. Stumbling down to the water's edge, pain flaring with every step, I pried open the door. It creaked like a rusty hinge. The inside reeked of stale water and rot, but the key was in the ignition. My heart thudded against my ribs as I twisted the key. The engine roared to life, sputtering and coughing in protest. I slammed it into gear and hit the accelerator. The truck lurched, tires spinning in the river muck, then lurched forward. The underbrush tore at the windows as I crashed through, heading back towards the woods, towards whatever fate awaited me there. It was better than the certain death by the river bank. Branches whipped and cracked against the windshield, the creature's roars cutting through the engines din somehow, miraculously. The truck plowed through, breaking back onto the deer trail I'd followed earlier. I slammed my foot down, desperate for speed, desperate to get away from that monstrous thing hunting my trail. Just when despair clawed at me again, the trail broke onto a gravel road. Civilization. It felt like a dream. I turned without thinking, the truck fishtailing, tires spitting gravel as I sped off with reckless abandon. I drove for hours, through the night and into the next day. I didn't know where I was going, just that I couldn't stop. It wasn't until a battered sign announcing a small town did I slow down, my exhausted body begging for respite. News of Allison's disappearance was cold comfort. The official story was a fatal hiking accident, but I knew better. There was nothing to do but return to Langley, face the music for failing my mission so spectacularly and for losing more than just a partner. The aftermath was a whirlwind of inquiries, debriefs, medical examinations. They poked and prodded, declared me unfit for field duty, and shunted me into a dead-end office job. My protests fell on deaf ears. Nobody believed my story of the creature. Trauma-induced delusions was the official verdict. And why would they... It defied all reason. The wound in my arm never fully healed, a jagged scar serving as a constant, sickening reminder. Nights are haunted by the memory of Allison's scream and those pitch-black eyes. The higher-ups, sensing I wouldn't let it go, eventually engineered my forced retirement. A generous pension was their way of buying silence. They think I'm broken— a casualty of some backwards mission gone bad. They're not entirely wrong. Part of me fractured and died in those mountains. Now I spend my days in forced anonymity, living in a cabin in the woods. Yes, the irony isn't lost on me. I keep an arsenal, watch the perimeter, and wait for the day the creature comes to finish what it started. My name's Dylan Baker, and this happened to me in the fall of 2016. I'm a field operative for a black ops branch of the CIA, the kind of guys they disavow if asked point-blank. Officially, I specialize in unconventional conflict resolution. Unofficially, I'm the monster hunter the government wishes it didn't need. My latest assignment sent me to the backwoods of rural North Carolina reports of mutilated livestock, not just killed, but ripped apart with an unnatural strength, and a handful of locals gone missing under increasingly bizarre circumstances. Standard cryptid fare, the kind that usually amounts to either a desperate recluse or a pack of wild dogs with a taste for the dramatic. Still, something not at my instincts about this one, 
something too methodical in the brutality. The locals were a tight-lipped bunch. They'd seen agents come and go, each promising answers, and delivering little but the kind of polite skepticism that makes a man's blood boil. I set up headquarters in an abandoned hunting cabin miles from the nearest paved road, deep in the tangled maze of the Appalachian foothills. I hated it here. The smothering damp clung to everything. The air was thick with the buzz of insects and a stillness that felt hungry, not peaceful. My first few days were spent in recon, hiking trails, mapping out the kill zones. The creature, whatever it was, had a pattern, erratic, but undeniably calculated. Locals talked about hearing unsettling noises at night, a low keening that made their dogs cower. All too familiar, that. We, too, I set up my traps, old-fashioned snares and tripwires, the kind used on big game, modified to hold something less mundane. Game cameras, too, rigged with infrared sensors. There was no guarantee whatever I was hunting would fall for it, but it was better than wandering blind. The waiting was its own kind of torture. The cabin felt claustrophobic, and I caught myself jumping at every rustle of leaves, every bird call. I was slipping, my usual ironclad focus fraying around the edges. Had to get a grip. Then came a stroke of luck or something as close to it as I was likely to get. One of the cameras tripped, the flash catching something monstrous in its brief glare. No blurry Bigfoot snapshot this, but a figure of bone-white flesh, grotesquely tall and emaciated. Its head was eerily canine, but the muzzle was too elongated, the jaw jutting out at an unnatural angle. The creature held something wriggling in one skeletal hand, a man by the build. No, not wriggling anymore. Lifeless. My stomach clenched. I'd been too late. With this proof, I finally convinced the sheriff's office to work with me, albeit grudgingly. Small-town cops weren't thrilled about some D.C. suit telling them there were things beyond their jurisdiction lurking in the woods took every ounce of my bureaucratic finesse to convince them to establish a perimeter, even just a token one. That night we went in, a grim posse armed with rifles, flashlights, and the gnawing sense of walking into a well-laid ambush. I kept the photo of the creature a secret, no sense in shattering their morale before we even caught sight of the damn thing. We tracked the creature for hours following a trail of blood and unidentifiable scraps of what might have once been clothing. Deeper into the woods, the air grew dense, heavy. Every so often, we'd catch a whiff of the same rotten sweet scent I'd encountered in Oregon years ago, the sure sign that its lair was close. Movement ahead, a flash of white disappearing behind a massive fallen oak tree. A low snarl echoed in the darkness, inhuman in its cold menace. We readied our weapons, training our lights on the tangle of roots and branches. Then it charged. Not in a chaotic rush, but with a terrifying, tactical precision. Deputy Monroe was in its path, frozen in terror. The creature slammed into him, sending his rifle flying into the undergrowth. I heard a scream cut short as it dragged him back towards the tree, disappearing into the shadows. Monroe! Someone bellowed, and we opened fire blindly. The creature screeched, a spine-chilling sound that ripped through the night. It shifted with unnatural speed, dodging most of our shots. A bullet creased its shoulder, spraying black ichor, and it snarled, dropping Monroe's limp body and vanishing deeper into the trees. Chaos erupted. I tried yelling orders, but the men were scattering, adrenaline overriding any semblance of training. They fired into the night, more out of panic than any hope of hitting the damn thing. In the aftermath, with the panicked deputies scrambling back towards the tree line, I found Monroe. He was alive, barely, 
blood soaking through his shredded uniform and eyes wide with shock. I dragged him clear of the rotting fallen tree, every instinct screaming that this wasn't over. Light it up! I yelled over the din of panic shouts and sporadic gunfire. One of the deputies fumbled with a flare, the sudden burst of light revealing a network of dark holes burrowed into the base of the fallen oak. Nest openings. This wasn't just a single hunter. It was a whole damn colony. Just as the thought crystallized, one of those holes pulsed outwards, a spray of dirt and decaying leaves obscuring the entrance. The creature launched itself from the darkness, moving with impossible speed. It caught Deputy Wilkes mid-stride, knocking him to the ground. Wilkes screamed, a primal, guttural sound as the creature clamped its jaws around his leg. He thrashed, firing his rifle wildly, more likely to hit one of us than his attacker. I had a clear line of sight, but it was constantly shifting, a blurred tangle of limbs and snapping teeth. I fired once, twice, and the creature yipped, stumbling but not releasing its grip. Wilkes kept screaming as it dragged him, sickeningly relentless, towards one of the gaping holes. Out of bullets, I lunged forward recklessly, a hunting knife my only weapon against this primeval horror. The creature turned as I reached it, leaving Wilkes whimpering on the blood-stained leaves. Its eyes, I saw them clearly in the flare's harsh light, not animalistic, but filled with a chilling intelligence. It knew exactly what it was doing. We weren't prey. We were obstacles. It swung at me. I dodged, more by luck than skill, and its claws ripped through my heavy jacket. I raised the knife, more in a gesture of defiance than with any real hope, but then I heard the roar of an approaching engine. Headlights cut through the trees. Sheriff Grady, in his battered old truck, barreled straight towards us. I shoved the creature aside just as the truck slammed into it, sending it tumbling in an ungainly heap. Grady hit the brakes, throwing open the door. Get in, he barked and for once in my life, I didn't hesitate. We hauled Wilkes, mercifully unconscious, into the truck bed and burned rubber back towards the road. The sound of the creatures, I couldn't even bring myself to think of them as singular anymore, screeching in rage followed us. A couple of them darted into the headlight beams, their skeletal forms casting monstrous shadows. I emptied my sidearm at them, useless, but there was a primal satisfaction in the noise. We didn't stop until we reached the perimeter line. Ambulances waited. Monroe, bless his stubborn soul, was still clinging to life, while Grady and I stumbled out and promptly hurled up the contents of our stomachs onto the gravel. The deputies stared, a mix of fear and awe in their eyes. I didn't feel like a hero just a man who'd looked into the abyss and gotten lucky enough to scramble back out. They met a vacked Monroe, shipped us off for decontamination and debriefing. Grady kept muttering, I told you, damn it, I told you there were monsters out there. Nobody believed him, of course. My official report detailed a feral animal attack, possible rabies outbreak in the local wildlife. Explanations, half-truths, the usual government whitewash. The photos, the evidence, all classified, sealed away alongside my nightmares. The aftermath is a blur. Mandatory psyche vows, the quiet suggestions that maybe field work wasn't for me anymore. I fought that. Fought tooth and nail for the right to be back out there, hunting the things nobody wants to admit exist. My nights are haunted by the memory of those empty black eyes, the taste of copper and sickly sweet rot filling my mouth at random moments. It gnaws at me, knowing with cold certainty that the North Carolina colony wasn't an anomaly. They're breeding out there, growing bolder. 
One night, in a cold sweat, I realized the truth. They aren't mindless beasts. They're tactical. Evolving. We aren't just a food source. We're a threat, and they will learn to counter us. My new mission is personal. I train with a renewed focus, haunted by the screams of good men. My truck is always packed, ready to go the moment the call comes. Some other backwater town, more missing persons, more mutilated corpses. They dismiss me as a shell-shocked adrenaline junkie. Maybe they're right. But I saw the faces of those deputies, heard their terror. And the next time someone reports unnatural sounds in the night, mutilated livestock, loved ones disappearing into the darkness. I'll be there, waiting in the shadows. It may not be a war I can win, but I'll be damned if I don't try to take a few of those monsters with me when I finally fall. My name's Grant Keller, and this happened to me in the spring of 2009. Been a field agent with the CIA for, well, let's just say it involves dodging gray hairs and mandatory retirement talks. My specialties covered infiltration, places where American boots on the ground wouldn't just be noticed, they'd start wars. This latest assignment felt different, though. Domestic op sent to the backwoods of Oregon to investigate whispers of meth production gone way wrong. Not exactly my usual counterterrorism stomping ground, but apparently the higher-ups got spooked by reports of erratic locals, violent outbursts, and a staggering number of disappearances. My cover story was watertight, just a conservation officer doing routine checks. Drove north in a rusted-out truck, flannel wardrobe bought special at a truck stop. The deeper I got into those mountains, the more I questioned whose idea this was. Locals kept to themselves, barely a nod at the new face. The air felt thick, heavy on my lungs. And the forest, dense ancient, like it held secrets the modern world wasn't meant to know. Spent my first week scouting logging roads, marking off abandoned cabins, trying to blend in with the scenery. The locals weren't the only ones giving me side-eye. Deer looked skittish, birds fell silent the moment I stepped foot on a trail. I started finding carcasses too half-eaten, like something with a bigger appetite than a coyote had been passing through. Then came the noises at night. Low growls, too deep for any animal I could name. Something circling my camp, leaving clawed gouges on the tree trunks just beyond the firelight. It ramped up the tension, a predator toying with its prey. I knew it was sizing me up. Word must have gotten around about the nosy conservation officer, because one morning, I found a grizzled old mountain man squatting by my truck, peering at the tires with a deep frown. Name's Elias, he grunted in a voice like sandpaper. You poked your nose too far in, fed boy. Things in these woods don't take kindly to strangers. The directness surprised me. Figured I'd best play along. Look, I'm not here to cause trouble. Just doing my job, I said, extending a hand. Elias ignored it. The blight, it's spreading. They come up from the old mines, all twisted now. This ain't no meth operation, this. He spat out the last word, disgust heavy in his tone. This is something unnatural. That's when he told me. About the old mining collapse decades ago, the rumors that it unearthed something that should have stayed buried. About his son, taken by the blight not a week back and how he tracked the thing back to a cave network on the mountainside. He shoved a scrap of paper in my hand, the map barely legible but good enough. That night I geared up. Night vision goggles, rifle loaded with custom rounds, a reinforced Kevlar vest hidden under my flannel shirt. 
the rational part of my brain yelled about walking into a suicide mission. The other part, the part that had me doing this damn job in the first place, whispered that maybe some things were more important than living. The cave mouth was shrouded in an unnatural fog. The smell hit me first copper, mixed with something rotten and sweet. My flashlight cut a weak swath into the gloom. The tunnel walls were slick, not bare rock, but something pulsing, organic. And there, on the cave floor, were the bodies. Not meth ravaged, but something far worse. Skin stretched tight over bone, eyes replaced by empty pits, their mouths locked in silent screams. Elias's son was among them, and fury ignited in me, a fiery counterpoint to the bone-deep chill seeping into the marrow of my being. A shadow moved deeper in the cave. My heart pounded in my ears as I raised the rifle, training it on the source. And that's when I saw it. Not the twisted face of a junkie, but something out of a nightmare. Its skin was translucent, stretched tight over a skeletal frame. Every rib, every sinew, the pulsing of its monstrous heart, was sickeningly visible. The head was a grotesque mockery of a human skull, the jaw jutting out at an impossible angle, lined with needle-like teeth. Its eyes, they were pure black orbs, reflecting the pitiful beam of my flashlight back at me. I fired. The concussion boomed off the cave walls, and the creature shrieked, a sound that pierced my skull. Its clawed hand shot out, raking my side. I stumbled back, pain flaring through me. It stalked forward, not hindered by the bullets lodged in its chest, but weakened. Dripping black ooze, not blood. I had one shot left in my rifle. Aimed for the head, and squeezed the trigger. The creature jerked, then collapsed to the ground, twitching in a grotesque parody of death. Silence fell, a chilling contrast to the minutes before. The foul stench in the cave nearly knocked me out. I gagged, stumbled outside, gulping in great lungfuls of air to clear the poison from my system. It took forever for the adrenaline rush to subside, for my shaking hands to stop. When I finally managed to stand upright, another wave of nausea hit me full force. Because there wasn't just one body in that cave. There were dozens. Maybe hundreds. Twisted, emaciated corpses piled against the walls, woven through the organic, pulsating substance that seemed to form the cavern itself. It dawned on me then, the terrible truth, this wasn't a dwelling, it was a nest. I radioed for backup, voice shaking so badly they could barely decipher my message. Extraction team, hazmat crew, hell, I told them to send in the damn army if they had to. This place, it wasn't just a threat, it was an extinction-level event waiting to happen. The waiting game nearly drove me insane. Every crack of a twig sent me spinning, gun raised. The image of the creature... The impossible blackness of its eyes haunted my every waking moment. Each night I jolted awake, convinced another one was crouched just outside my tense flimsy flap. When the backup finally arrived two days later, I was a ragged mess. Bloodshot eyes hadn't slept in what felt like a year, and reeked of caves and monster and a fear that had taken up permanent residence in my gut. The look on the hazmat team leader's face said it all. They'd thought my panicked report the ravings of a cracked agent, but the sight of the cave opening, well, that shut them up real quick. The cleanup operation was a logistical nightmare. Containment zone, incinerating every damn thing, the sheer scale of it was numbing. They called it an ecological disaster, blamed a toxic gas leak from the old mine, anything but the truth. Me. I was shipped off with a gag order so tight it threatened to choke me and a whole lot of mandated therapy with a shrink who'd probably crack if she heard the real story. The aftermath, 
That's the worst part. It ain't the nightmares, or the way I jump at any sound in the night, or the constant, nagging dread that something else, something worse, might still be lurking out there. It's the knowledge of what they covered up, and the sinking certainty that nobody up the chain of command believes a word of it. I did my job. Fought a monster most folks won't ever know existed. Saved lives, maybe even the whole damn country, or bought us a bit more time, at least. That should have earned me a commendation, maybe a quiet retirement out on a beach somewhere. Instead, I got branded with the scarlet letter, PTSD. Unstable, unreliable, and permanently shuffled off to a cushy office job. Here's the thing about monsters. You kill one, there's likely a whole brood waiting in the shadows. The higher-ups, with their sanitized reports and risk assessments, they don't get it. I do. The Oregon Nest, it wasn't the beginning. If anything, it might have just been a warning. So, I spend my days pushing papers, the gun I keep hidden under my desk my only comfort. My nights, well, those are filled with the scratching sounds I convince myself come from the leaky old radiator, and the distant, echoing howls that always, always fade away just before dawn. This cubicle is my new battlefield, the endless memos my enemy now. My war ain't done. Because deep down, I know that someday, some poor unsuspecting agent's gonna get called to some remote, backwards town where the locals act shifty, and they'll find the signs, and the bodies, and they'll step into the cave, clueless as I once was. They'll send out a scrambled distress call, one that might get dismissed as the hallucinations of an overworked mind, and the cycle will start all over again. They'll never be ready. Nobody ever is. Except maybe for me. I'll keep listening for that transmission, buried under the mundane static of daily reports. And when it comes, I won't wait for backup or for permission. Protocol be damned. I'll load my gun, get into my rusty truck, and drive. Maybe this time I can stop the blight from spreading. Maybe this time they'll finally listen to the man who stared into the abyss and lived to tell the tale. Or maybe, I'll end up another nameless corpse in the belly of the beast. Either way, sitting here doing nothing, well, that ain't an option anymore. There are monsters out there, and they don't give a damn about bureaucracy. My name is Carter Hayes and this happened to me on October 3rd, 1991. Back then, I was fresh out of Quantico, a newly minted FBI agent with bright eyes and a whole lot of ambition. I thought I'd seen the worst of humanity, but that was before I got assigned to the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming. A sprawling, remote expanse of rugged mountains, wide-open prairies, and a deep-rooted history of both resilience and tragedy. It was a place that felt both beautiful and haunted in equal measure. I'd been sent here as part of a task force investigating a series of livestock mutilations. At first, it seemed like the usual suspects, coyotes, cougars, maybe the occasional wolf venturing down from its mountain territory. But this was different. The carcasses were wrong, ripped to shreds with an inhuman savagery, and often missing parts in a way that no known predator would bother with. The ranchers were panicked, terrified of losing more cattle, their livelihoods hanging in the balance. Meanwhile, the tribal elders spoke in hushed tones of legends, of old stories that sent chills down even my jaded, too-cool-for-supernatural-nonsense spine. My partner, Agent Ben Wilson, was a veteran agent and a Wyoming native. He knew the terrain like the back of his hand. Never underestimate this place, he told me. There's things out here, 
older than either of us. Things it's best not to tangle with. At the time, I chalked it up to local superstition. Now, well, I'm not so sure. One evening, we got a call about a fresh kill. Located in a remote canyon, far from any ranch. It took us hours to get there, the truck bouncing over rough terrain until even the dirt road petered out. We hiked the rest of the way, flashlights cutting through the dusk as we approached the scene. And that's when we saw it. Crouched over the eviscerated carcass of a steer was a creature straight out of nightmares. Hulking, its leathery skin seeming to shimmer in the moonlight. Claws the size of dinner knives, a snout filled with jagged fangs. But its eyes, those were the worst. Not the red, glowing eyes of some demon from a B-movie, but cold, flat, and reflecting the intelligence of a predator far older and more cunning than anything in the FBI field guide. I fumbled for my weapon, but Ben put a hand on my arm. Slow, he whispered. It'll tear us apart if we spook it. The creature lifted its head, its gaze locking on to ours. Its lips pulled back in a grotesque snarl, and it let out a hiss that made my blood run cold. It was a challenge, a territorial claim. I'd glimpsed into the eyes of pure, unfiltered wildness, and I knew it could end us in seconds. We need to back off, Ben said, his voice barely above a whisper. Slowly. We retreated, step by step, our eyes never leaving the creature. It never charged, content to let us go, to return to its grisly feast. Back at the truck, we both looked at each other, an unspoken understanding passing between us. There was an unspoken question hanging between us. What the hell was that? There was no way we could report this. We both knew it. Our careers would be over, chalked up as delusional ramblings. Instead, we concocted a cover story, blamed the mutilations on rogue wolves, increased patrols in the area to soothe the ranchers, anything but utter the impossible truth. That night, back at the dingy motel that passed for lodgings at the reservation's edge, either of us slept. I swore to Ben I'd find a way to document this to track the creature without risking the dismissal that would follow official channels. Ben just sighed, a weary sound from a man who had seen too much already, and wished he hadn't. The next morning, disaster struck. Ben never returned from his morning run. We searched for hours, a sickening dread rising with each passing minute. We found him in a ravine, his body shattered, his death eerily mirroring the slaughtered cattle. It looked like a fall, an accident, but I knew better. The creature had made it clear. This was its territory, and we were intruders who had overstayed our welcome. The official ruling was a tragic accident. The case files were sealed, whispers about my partner's erratic behavior and mental health declined conveniently circulating to discredit anything I might say. I tried fighting. I requested backup, argued my case based on the forensic evidence, but I ran face first into a wall of bureaucracy and chilling indifference. My protests were ignored, my warnings dismissed. I was, in official terms, a problem. A loose cannon. The FBI offered me a desk job far away from the Wind River Reservation, a thinly veiled exile. I refused, handed in my badge, and walked away from the only life I'd ever wanted. It's been twenty years since. I live off the grid in a cabin tucked deep in the northern Cascades, a place similar to the reservation, just as wild. I spend my days tracking. Not the creature— Nothing that powerful can be easily followed, but other disappearances, other deaths written off as the wilderness claiming another victim. I've learned a few things along the way. There are more of those creatures out there, lurking in the remote corners of the country, 
occasionally snatching the unwary who wander too close to the border between the known and the unknown. I've made contact with others like me, former cops, disillusioned hunters, people driven half-mad by the glimpses they'd caught. Together we form a loose, unofficial network, sharing information and warnings. Last week I got a call from a scared park ranger near Yellowstone. Mutilated elk carcasses, the all-too-familiar patterns. The creature, or one like it, moving south. My rifles and my truck, supplies laid out. I should sleep, but sleep evades me. Every rustle of leaves outside my cabin sets my heart thundering against my ribs. The shadows seem to stretch and warp, playing tricks on my eyes. There's a low rasping sound, or is that just the wind rattling the window pane? Sometimes I miss my old life, the normalcy of it all. But then I remember Ben, his broken body in the ravine. I remember the cold, flat eyes of the creature, and I know there's no going back. There's only the hunt, and the hope that one day, maybe, the hunters will become the hunted. My name is Jason Cole. And this happened to me on February 8, 2006. I'm an agent with the CIA's Special Activities Center, the paramilitary side of things. We handle the ops no one wants to admit officially exist, the deniable missions lurking in the shadows where most people prefer not to look. I've seen my share of the dark underbelly of the world, and come out the other side with my sanity mostly intact. Turns out, the real monsters aren't always the ones in the news. My current assignment had me deep in the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. Rugged, untamed, the Gila is a vast wilderness area of canyons, mountains, and old-growth forests. The official reason for my presence was surveillance for a suspected smuggling operation. The truth was, well, a lot weirder and a whole lot less plausible for public consumption. For months, there'd been a series of unexplained cattle mutilations in the area. At first, it seemed like a run-of-the-mill weird crime, the kind the Bureau tossed my way because no one else wanted it. But these mutilations were different. The carcasses were torn apart, organs often missing with surgical precision, and no sign of scavenger activity. Locals whispered of chupacabras and skinwalkers, but anyone who'd spent some time in the field knew better. Those were just stories to explain the unexplainable. My partner was a seasoned Special Forces veteran named Marcus Reed. Marcus had that quiet, unbreakable aura of a man who'd seen too much action and come back with nerves of steel. If anyone could keep a cool head, it was him. Night had fallen when we got the first alert. A panicked rancher reported movement in his fields. We reached his property just after midnight, headlights cutting through the dust stirred up by our truck. The rancher, a burly man named Hank, was sweating, a rifle clutched in his hands. He pointed to a dark tree lean. There, he yelled, his voice hoarse with fear. I scanned the darkness, night vision blurring the edges of the forest with an eerie green glow. Then I saw it, a pair of yellow eyes reflecting back at us. They were too high to be any animal I knew. I motioned to Marcus, and together we advanced, weapons at the ready. As we got closer, the creature materialized from the shadows. This was no myth, no campfire tale. It stood on two powerful legs, its torso humanoid but thick, covered in coarse fur. The snout was long, filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth, and its claws, those were designed to shred, to disembowel. Before either of us could fire, it charged. Marcus let loose a burst from his automatic rifle. The creature staggered, a roar echoing through the night, but didn't go down. 
It lunged at him, knocking the gun from his grasp. Marcus went sprawling, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought he was done for. I yelled, drawing the creature's attention. It whipped around, those unnaturally intelligent eyes focused on me. I fired a controlled burst, aiming center mass. It roared again, more in fury than pain, and charged. I dived to the side, rolling behind a gnarled tree. I could hear the creature tearing through the underbrush, its guttural snarl growing closer. Then there was the thud of something heavy hitting the ground and a wet ripping sound. I risked a look. Marcus was on the ground, his leg twisted at an impossible angle beneath him. The creature was feasting, oblivious to anything else. I couldn't leave him, but I knew I couldn't fight that thing in close quarters. I needed backup, a heavy weapon, anything to even the odds. I ran back to the truck, fumbled with the radio, and barked out an emergency call. Every second was an eternity as I waited, the sounds of Marcus's screams fading into choked gasps. I prayed for backup to arrive in time, but deep down, I knew it was a lost cause. As I slammed fresh ammo into my rifle, I made a decision. I wasn't the kind of man who left a comrade behind, even if it was a doomed gesture. The creature would hear me coming, but with a bit of luck, I could draw it away by Marcus' precious seconds. Maybe, just maybe, there was a chance one of us would get out alive. I took a deep breath and moved back towards the trees. Every creak of a branch, every dry twig snapping beneath my boots sounded amplified in the still night air. The stench of blood mixed with the sharp, metallic scent of fear. I found them in a small clearing, illuminated by the pale moonlight. Marcus was barely recognizable, his form a broken, bloody ruin. The creature hunched over him, tearing relentlessly at the remains. It didn't even look up as I approached. That same cold predator focus I saw when it first attacked was still there, fixated on its gruesome task. I aimed for the head, hoping for a clean, quick end. I squeezed the trigger. The first shot hit, sending the creature staggering back. It let out a bellow of pain and rage that sent chills down my spine. I fired again. Then again. Still, it didn't go down. Enraged, the creature whirled, swiping at the air with its claws. Yellow eyes locked onto mine, and I knew it was coming for me next. My heart pounded in my chest, a frantic drumbeat counting down the seconds. I heard the distant wail of sirens, a glimmer of hope in the desolate night. The creature hesitated, its gaze flickering between me and the approaching sound. Survival instinct, however twisted and primal, overrode its bloodlust. It turned and sprinted off into the trees, disappearing into the darkness with shocking speed. I ran to Marcus, but it was too late. The sirens got closer became the shouts of my backup team. They found me kneeling beside my partner's mangled body, an empty rifle in my hands and the stench of the kill still clinging to the air. The aftermath was a mess of red tape and whispered cover-ups. Marcus's death was declared a tragic accident, an unfortunate encounter with a possible black bear disturbed during hibernation. The case was buried, my report relegated to a dust-gathering file only accessible to those with the highest clearance. Those of us in the know recognized a pattern too monstrous to acknowledge. My name is Alex Shepard, and this happened to me on July 22, 1995. I was a special forces operator back then before they shunted me into the CIA's more clandestine activities. Me and my team were sent to Appalachia, 
West Virginia Territory to track down a militia group linked to a series of bombings. Routine operation, or so we thought. Appalachia is wild country. Steep mountains, thick forests, hollers so isolated even the locals give them a wide berth. A place where old ways die hard, and outsiders aren't exactly welcomed. Locals told us the militia was holed up at a disused coal mine, deep in the hills. We reached the mine entrance just before dawn. It was an ugly, crumbling structure, half reclaimed by the wilderness. Sergeant Hayes, our team leader, motioned us into position. Standard breach and clear, he murmured into the radio. Remember, these guys are armed and dangerous. But they're not trained soldiers. We go in fast, in tight formation, hit em hard. They won't know what hit em. I wasn't so sure about that. Something about the silence hanging over the mind felt off. You develop a sixth sense for that kind of thing after enough time in the field. I whispered a warning to the rookie beside me, a kid named Kowalski. He just grinned back, green and a little too eager. We stormed the entrance. The first wave went through, flash bangs detonating with deafening cracks, suppressing fire echoing through the narrow shaft. No return fire. No screams. Nothing. Hayes waved us forward, the second wave. I'd pushed through the choking dust and into the tunnel. And that's when I saw it. Or, more precisely, I saw them. Not militia goons with cheap assault rifles, but bodies. Men in tattered camouflage, torn apart in a way that no human could do. Limbs bent at gruesome angles, flesh shredded like it had been raked with giant talons. Blood everywhere, old and fresh. I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that whatever made those kills was still in there, waiting. Hayes swore low behind me. Where the hell are the militia? Fall back. Fall back. Easier said than done. The tunnel was tight, barely wide enough for two men to walk abreast. We stumbled as we tried to retreat, the radio crackling with panicked cries from the team at the entrance. That was when the roar came. It echoed through the tunnel, a bone-jarring bellow that wasn't quite animal, but wasn't anything I could name either. Then, the shadows at the far end of the tunnel shifted. A shape emerged, massive and hunched, moving with a fluid, unnatural speed. Open fire! Hayes shouted, but even as we raised our weapons, it was upon us. Kowalski, poor kid, got it first. The creature snatched him up like he weighed nothing, its jaws clamping down on his torso with a wet crunch. He didn't even have time to scream. There was chaos. Flashlights making wild arcs, gunshots deafening in the enclosed space, the stench of blood and something else, foul and musky. I fired until my rifle clicked dry. It didn't seem to do a damn thing. The creature was built for killing. Each clawed limb seemed to move independently, slashing and tearing its way through our ranks like we were made of paper. Its hide was thick, bullets glancing off uselessly. Someone yelled, Grenades! Two pineapples hit the ground near its feet. My heart lurched. Closed space, heavy explosives. It would kill us all. The explosions tore through the tunnel, and for a second, there was only blinding light and searing heat. Then silence. I coughed, the dust in my throat like acid. My ears rang, and my vision was blurred, but I was alive. Status! Hayes's voice, choked but steady. One by one, ragged voices answered. Half of us were gone. The rest were wounded, but at least the grenades had stopped the creature. Or so I thought. Hayes flicked on a fresh flashlight. In the beam of light, we saw that the grenades hadn't done any damage. 
The creature crouched amidst the debris, apparently unfazed. Then its head swiveled. In the darkness of the tunnel, its eyes shone with malevolent yellow light. Run! It was Kowalski, somehow still alive, a mangled mess on the floor. Run, you sons of— His voice cut off in a wet gurgle. We didn't need telling twice. Stumbling over the bodies of our comrades, we sprinted for the entrance. Behind us, the creature roared in fury, the sound propelling us forward in a blind panic. We burst out of the tunnel into the cold dawn air. I didn't look back until I reached the tree lean. The mine entrance was empty. The creature was gone, vanished back into the depths from which it came. The official story became a tragic training accident. Casualties covered up, survivors sworn to silence. I spent weeks in the military hospital, my wounds healing faster than any doc had ever seen. But the real damage wasn't physical. Nightmares stalked me, the echoing roar of the creature, the cold glimmer of those inhuman eyes. I left the military after that drifted for a while. The CIA snapped me up, figured I was already broken enough to handle the things normal people couldn't stomach. They weren't wrong. I spent years hunting, chasing shadows. Each report of mangled cattle, each unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country. I was there, hoping to face the monster again. Hoping, maybe, to put the damn thing down. Never found it. But I know, with an iron certainty, that it's still out there. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine I can hear that bone-chilling roar, and a cold sweat breaks out on my skin. Because out there, in the vast stretches of forgotten wilderness, the creature from the mine waits. Hunting. And one day, our paths might cross again. My name is Thomas Grant, and this happened to me on October 12, 2012. Back then, I was the closest thing the CIA had to a monster hunter. Sounds ridiculous, I know. But when you've been tucked away in the classified corners of the agency long enough, you realize the world is a much stranger place than most people like to imagine. My assignment had sent me deep into the heart of the Ozark Mountains, rugged, untamed country crisscrossed by twisting backroads and shadowed by ancient trees. Locals whispered about folks who'd vanished on lonely trails, about mutilated livestock and eerie howls in the night. The usual small-town spooky stories. Most agents wouldn't give them a second glance, but I'd learned to take those whispers seriously. I found the first body at the edge of a ravine, half hidden under decaying leaves. No easy explanation here. The victim had been torn apart with an inhuman ferocity that defied any predator I'd ever seen. The wounds were too clean, too precise. This wasn't an animal attack. The hunt dragged on. I trekked through dense forests, following a trail only I could sense. Spooked locals shared hushed tales of a creature lurking on the fringes of civilization, snatching victims and disappearing back into the wilds. They said it moved like a shadow, with eyes as cold as the winter moon. My gut instinct told me they weren't spinning campfire stories. Nights were the worst. Darkness settled heavy on those ancient mountains, and the forest came alive with strange rustles, with movements just beyond the limited reach of my flashlight. I swear I could feel those eyes on me sometimes, a chilling prickle on the back of my neck. Sleep was a luxury I couldn't afford, not while the creature was out there. I followed the trail for days. Finally, it led me to an abandoned sawmill, its rotting machinery half-reclaimed by the forest. A perfect place for something monstrous to hide. The air inside was heavy with a coppery, 
feral scent that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Moving silently, weapon at the ready, I pushed deeper into the derelict building. The shadows seemed to writhe and shift, playing tricks on my eyes. Then I saw it. Crouched atop a rusted pile of machinery, it was a silhouette in the gloom, hunched and muscular. As it turned, lamplight glinted on a pair of unnaturally bright eyes, and a flash of teeth that looked far too long and far too sharp. It was unlike anything in the zoology textbooks. A feral blend of familiar predators, but twisted and wrong. Its shoulders hunched as it sized me up, calculating. I could practically feel the primal intelligence radiating from it, a cold, hungry cunning. With a low growl that set my teeth on edge, it lunged. I fired, more out of a survival instinct than any hope of hitting a target moving that fast in the half-light. The creature dodged, vanishing back into the darkness with shocking agility. I heard a crash, a splintering of wood, and then silence. I waited, heart pounding in my ears, searching for a sign, any sign, of where it had gone. The whole world seemed to hold its breath. Then, from behind me, came a chilling hiss. I whirled, but too late. The creature was blindingly fast. It hit me like a truck, knocking me off my feet and sending my weapon flying. Claws ripped through my Kevlar vest-like tissue paper. Pain, white-hot, exploded through my shoulder. I fought back instinctively, but it was futile. The creature was simply too powerful. Its jaws snapped from my throat, but I managed to twist my head away in time. My hand found a loose piece of rebar. With a desperate surge of adrenaline, I lashed out, striking the creature across the snout. It snarled, a guttural, rage-filled sound, and jerked back. I staggered to my knees, clutching my wounded shoulder, and scrabbled for my dropped gun. The creature watched me, yellow eyes blazing. For a tense moment, we circled each other. Both wounded, both desperate. I knew I couldn't survive another round. Time seemed to slow. My gun clicked on an empty chamber. The creature lunged, a blur of muscle and teeth. I closed my eyes, bracing for the end, and heard a deafening crack. The creature shrieked a bone-chilling sound that ripped through the air. I opened my eyes in shock. The beast was thrashing wildly, pinned to the ground, its leg twisted at an unnatural angle beneath a heavy, rusted gear. Pure dumb luck, a freak accident that had bought me a few precious seconds. I scrambled for my backup weapon, strapped to my ankle. The creature struggled against the machinery, snarling and snapping. There was no time to aim for a clean shot. I fired, once, twice, three times, until its movements stilled, until those eerily luminous eyes finally dimmed. Silence fell over the sawmill, broken only by the ragged rasp of my own breathing. It was over. I staggered over to the creature's body. Up close, the details were even more grotesque, coarse from matted with blood, a jaw contorted in a final snarl, claws the size of butcher knives. This was no myth, no campfire story. Whatever evolutionary path had spawned this thing remained a terrifying mystery. The aftermath was a blur of debriefs, cover-ups, and carefully crafted paperwork designed to sweep the whole incident under the rug. I never saw the Ozarks again, transferred to a desk job where I could be contained, my knowledge too dangerous for the comfort of my superiors. But some nights, in the darkness of my bland government issue apartment, I feel the phantom ache in my shoulder, remember the cold gleam in those inhuman eyes. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, there are more creatures like it out there. They hunt on the fringes, slipping between the cracks of our reality. And I pray that when they finally come for the cities, 
For the unsuspecting masses, someone is there on the front lines who still believes in monsters. My name is Alex Shepard, and this happened to me on October 6, 1991. Back then, I was green, fresh out of Quantico, and assigned to one of the CIA's more specialized divisions. The kind that handles the kind of stuff that'd get you laughed out of most FBI offices. I just started dating this girl, Sarah a nurse with a heart of gold and a laugh that could disarm a nuclear bomb. Thinking back, I guess, is why I still remember the exact date. It's burned into my memory now. My latest assignment was a doozy, even by my standards. Turns out, a small town in the Smoky Mountains had a problem. A rash of unexplained disappearances. Livestock slaughtered with chilling efficiency. The locals spun wild yarns of half-seen figures lurking just beyond the campfire light, whispered about hauntings and skinwalkers. I figured it was meth addicts or some serial killer with a flair for the dramatic, but my superiors saw an opportunity, a chance to field-test our theories about other potential threats lurking in the shadows. The town of Ashwood, Tennessee, was the epitome of small-town America, a main street lined with quaint storefronts, a white steepled church, and an air of quiet watchfulness that set my teeth on edge. I set up a makeshift base in a room above the general store, with my equipment spread across the creaky wooden floors. The first few days were spent interviewing locals and hiking the dense trails that snaked through the surrounding hills. Standard Procedure I listened to tales passed down through generations, sifted through the paranoia for any kernel of truth. There was a pattern, that much was clear. Victims vanished at night, near the tree lean, with zero evidence left behind. Whatever was out there was efficient, meticulous, unnatural. That third night in Ashwood, I decided it was time to go from observer to hunter. Armed with a rifle, night vision goggles, and a healthy dose of skepticism, I staked out a spot near the site of the most recent disappearance. It was well past midnight, the forest bathed in an eerie, silvery glow, when I heard it. A rustle in the underbrush, then a low snarl that cut through the silence like a knife. Adrenaline surged through my veins. Whatever made that sound, it wasn't human. With painstaking slowness, I turned, night vision goggles amplifying the gloom. And that's when I saw it. Crouched in the shadows, not ten feet from me, was a creature straight out of nightmares. It was impossibly large, sleek as a panther but twice the size, with coarse, mangy fur. But it was the eyes that chilled my blood, two burning coals of yellow light, reflecting back the pale moonlight. And as realization dawned, that was when it moved. The creature was a blur, impossibly fast for its size. I barely had time to raise my rifle before it was upon me, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I fired, more out of instinct than aim, and the night erupted in a cacophony of noise, the creature letting out a hiss of pain. But it wasn't enough. It knocked the rifle from my hands its claws raking across my arm, a burst of white-hot pain. Desperation fueled me. I fumbled for the pistol strapped to my leg, but the creature was back, lunging for my throat. I twisted, throwing myself backwards just in time as its teeth snapped shut on empty air. I rolled, scrambled to my feet, the creature circling me with calculated alertness. A flicker of movement caught my eye, my rifle, lying several feet away. I made a mad dash for it, all my survival instincts screaming in protest. Reaching the rifle felt like a lifetime. Each second I expected to feel the searing pain of claws sinking into my flesh. I fumbled with the weapon, 
hearing the creature snarl behind me. I turned, raising the rifle in one desperate motion. It was just in time. The creature lunged, a monstrous shadow hurtling towards me. I squeezed the trigger once, twice, three times. The impact of the bullets threw it back, and it let out a guttural roar that echoed through the forest. In the dim light, I could see dark patches bloom on its fur. Blood. It was wounded, but far from dead. Instinctively, I knew this was my chance. Ignoring the fiery pain in my arm, I bolted back towards the town. The creature hesitated for a moment, then lunged after me, its snarls growing in intensity with each step. I ran like hell, my lungs burning, the sound of its pursuit drumming in my ears. Ahead I saw the first flickering lights of Ashwood. My shouts ripped through the night. The creature, perhaps sensing an ambush, broke off its pursuit at the edge of the forest, dissolving back into the shadows. But I could see its eyes, those gleaming yellow orbs, following me all the way back to safety. The aftermath was a mess of cover-ups, hush money, and official reports filed under unsolved animal attacks. My injuries healed, slowly, leaving behind scars both physical and mental. I broke up with Sarah couldn't explain the nightmares, the sudden bursts of paranoia, even to myself. I'm still with the agency, still hunting things that go bump in the night. They ship me from one godforsaken corner of the country to another, wherever a whisper of something monstrous sends ripples through the rural heartland. I've tracked creatures beyond count, each one more disturbing than the last, but none have haunted me like the beast in the Smoky Mountains. Because with each new assignment, with each chilling encounter, the question burns in my gut, was it the same creature? Did I simply wound and displace it, driving it to other hunting grounds? Or are there more of its kind out there, lurking and unseen?'